Here at 7.01, I see that all board members are present. Um, welcome to um, all those who are in attendance as well. Um, we are on to item two, approval of the agenda. Um, and before we make a motion, um, I'd like to consider um, two things. One, I ask that we move the review and action item 9B, so the resolution for um, Proposition 19 to become our 9A, as we will have Larry Stone available to answer questions and kind of share a little bit more about that. And I also want to make note um, that when we get to item 14, um, the last item about future meetings, we will briefly discuss topics for our upcoming study session. I'll move that we approve tonight's agenda with the changes, the modifications okay. that uh, you mentioned, Michelle. I will second that. All right, board, any um, questions or comments before we vote? All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Chair votes aye, and with that, the um, amended agenda has been approved. We will now go to um, item three, comments from the board and superintendent. And do we usually start with Jeff or Nancy? I don't remember. <laughs> I could start. Um, it's been a pretty busy time, um, board related though. Um, I participated in the, uh, management retreat. That was a great half day, um, well managed, uh, considering the circumstances. So I, uh, do appreciate that. It was good to know, get to know, um, a lot of staff members on our, on our team. So thank you very much for that. Go ahead, Nancy. Okay. Um, I wanted to let the board know that I filed for um, candidacy again um, uh, because um, Ms. Myers is retiring. Um, the the um, deadline was extended and the Registrar of Voters will make it official on Friday but to the best of my knowledge, no one else has filed at, at this touch point, which was supposed to be a uh, cutoff time. Is, is uh, well, I, I mean, ex except, except um, Isabel. So um, uh, we'll find out more about that later on. Um, I also was asked to um, reapply to the local planning council for early, um, uh, uh, childhood um, uh, education and I'll find out about that um, later on this month. Um, I've done a lot of work um, during, uh, with regards to equity. I've had several meetings with Bridget to talk about the equity uh, plan and we also had a um, meeting with Mike uh, with those regards. I spent um, two days in um, uh, meetings at uh, Zooming to the Santa Clara County um, Office of Education around um, et an ethnic studies initiative, and it's very, very um, exciting. Um, doing lots of webinars on um, what um, teachers are uh, doing as far as distance learning, um, building my competencies around all the different Google applications that are available. Um, and also how to teach using Zoom, which is different than the Zoom experience that we're having right, right now. I too uh, attended the management retreat and I um, appreciated getting to know people even in a virtual world. Um, that was uh, very well um, done. I think that um, Dr. Gallagher bridged the gap in a very meaningful way. Um, um, I've also been doing uh, work with the Santa Clara County School Boards Association, and I wanted to let you know that um, they're setting up a legislative, a local legislative um, working group, and I'm going to be participating in that for this next um, upcoming year. And I'm signed up for the Brown Act um, next week. Um, I think along with Bridget, that CSBA is is doing.
that's the end of my comments. Hello? What's happening? Thanks, Nancy. We hear you. We hear you. Go ahead, Bridget. Hey, um, so a lot of the things that I've been doing have been mentioned, the management retreat, which was super, it was so well done. I really thought it was great. And I loved how the opportunity for creativity and breaking out into the small groups and then coming back and it was just really organized and I just love the um, the attitude of everyone who was attending and you know kind of the willingness to to tackle the year ahead basically um, and you know I just just the whole spirit of the thing was great I thought um, I've been going to a lot of webinars as well and I did go to one of the elementary schools back to school um, orientations from a principal um, and you know one of the webinars I went to was on for, from CSBA was uh, on the uh, reopening and one of the things I took away from it was you know just how important I know that we're going into a virtual world uh, I mean a virtual teaching environment whether it's independent study or virtual school but I think it is still important to recognize that because of the pandemic we still are even though it's more organized we 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 still are in crisis teaching because we're still making it up as we go along and yes we have more resources and we're a bit more prepared but we don't necessarily know we know more but we don't know what the next step is and there's a lot of, there's potentially so much disruption and trauma at home so i just i just really um what I liked about this one that I saw, I don't know if any of you went to the one with like a large, medium and large districts, but one of the presenters said, you know, accountability is different now. When we look at holding ourselves accountable, they said, um, it's just so important. Accountability becomes more about like, how can we all do this together? And coaching and paying attention and just the idea that we're all in this together and that we, we're gonna have to like, do our best and recognize that everyone's doing their best. So I just, they had a lot of ideas that when we get to the updates on COVID, um, I might ask about, but in general, um, some of the other cities are donating their outdoor space to districts uh, for like LA County is donating their outdoor spaces at their libraries and parks. Um, and I know we, we've got some, correspondence on outdoor spaces. So that was interesting on how they were handling it. And then just, um, what was the other thing on there? Oh, well, anyway, I just, I just really have been learning a lot with webinars and it, I like that when things are a little bit asynchronous, if you register, you can listen to them later. So I feel like I'm listening to podcasts all the time. Um, but yeah, that's it for me. I'm going to jump in. It's Reed. Um, so we haven't had an actual regular, we've had a lot of board meetings, but we haven't had an actual regular board meeting in like a month. So I wrote a few things down. Um, I know we've all been doing a lot of stuff that we probably have forgotten by now because every day seems like a new adventure. Um, so we had a call with delegates last week and there was a list of recommendations for a ton of changes for delegate assembly. I'm sure some of them will be implemented, but one of the, one of the recommendations from this group that was put together and have worked on this for three years was to have one delegate per school district, which typically usually is the case, but they're thinking about making that formalized. Um, and just a lot of other recommendations that I'll bring to you guys um, if they get passed. I'm assuming a lot won't. Um, we had a lot of conversations about some of them and they were very controversial. So I'm not sure what's gonna change, but I think it's good that the delegates are sort of looking at what's working and what's not working and hopefully there'll be some improvements um, down the road. Um, Let's see, oh, so we do, I think you all know by now, we have a new PACER um, with CSBA, and I can't remember what PACER stands for, but basically he's our liaison um, for legislative issues between our districts and CSBA. His name is Marty Fatu, and he's a, such a nice guy. Um, had a nice long conversation with him. He's really interested in learning. He knows a lot about how the legislative process works, but not a lot about education. So, um, so he's learning as he goes along and, I'm trying to build relationships. And I know Mike and Bridget um, have intentions to talk to him. I think he's reached out to you guys. 
Um, we did ask him about Prop 19 because that's on our agenda tonight. And he got back to me and said that CSBA is not taking any stance on Prop 19. Um, we'll be discussing that. They're remaining neutral. Um, he did talk about um, Prop 18 and Prop um, 16, which are Prop 16 is um, eliminating affirmative action, which um, and then Prop 18 is about letting 17 year olds vote in California. And those would be 17 year olds who would be 18 um, for the general election. So those will all be on our ballot and CSBA will be voting on whether or not they're gonna take a stance on those um, in November. And then of course there's the Prop 13 kind of redo, which I think is Prop 15, Mike? Yeah. Yes. So, um, and that CSBA decided not to take a stance on. There was a long debate about that one. I think I mentioned that a while ago. Um, I signed the ballot statement there for Fremont Union High School District. They're gonna be having a bond on their ballot. So uh, on our ballot, so just so you know about that. Um, been speaking to a lot of parents about issues, concerns, just everything that's going on. So that's been good. Um, I listened to a couple of Fremont Union back to school uh, webinars, and it's been good for to do that because it makes me realize that you know no, nobody has all the answers. And when I listen to those um, calls, you know, it, it just makes me feel like we're all in the same boat and we're starting to get the answers as we move forward, but they're still, we're still working things through as we go. And I know we have a lot more answers today than we did a week ago. Um, the city did a listening session on equity and um, Tasha did an amazing job. Mike did an amazing job, loved listening to that. Um, great to hear what some of our kids had to say. It kind of came from the Black Lives Matter movement and it was a focus on students, so that was great. Um, attended summer school. I know a lot of you guys had done that as well. Um, talked to some candidates who are running for other school boards and for city council. So that's been interesting. And a lot of Santa Clara County School Boards Association meetings, but not today because I've been in, in uh, San Diego on vacation. So um, I think that's it for me. I just want to also say my daughter is going to college on Tuesday. So I'm going to be a bit of a mess next week. I don't think we have a board meeting, so you won't see me in tears. I'm happy she's going to go live her life um, and do her thing online in Ohio, um, but not from home. And I think it's good for her. So we'll see what happens. Thanks. Thanks, Reed. Thanks, everyone. Um, lots of similar things, right? I feel like continuing to read, attend meetings and web webinars to be informed on, you know, issues related to COVID-19 in our county generally and how it affects schools. Um, best practices related to distance learning, how as board members we can support the district, um, and just other issues, right? Kind of like, I like when Bridget said, it's like you're listening to stuff. And I feel like I'm listening and reading to things all the time. Um, and I've heard from, um, recently now, as the principals have come back, I've heard from a few families how um, being able to see their uh, principals in Zoom or connect with them and back to their school sites that just, I think, connecting with faces that they are familiar with has been um, a nice thing for them. Um, on just kind of a personal note, I think for, for me, but I think this is probably true of most people, this summer was not um, as relaxing or rejuvenating as it normally would be um, for most people. It was instead for me unusual and stressful. Um, so just as I was kind of reflecting on that before this board meeting and reflecting on where you know, normally when we come back to this meeting, I know staff was working through the summer, but usually staff has a little bit of downtime. That's when they often go on their trips or whatnot. Um, but board you, kind of has the month of July when we come back and everyone's full of energy and rejuvenated and excited. And hopefully we have energy and we are excited, but I think we don't have that rejuvenation. And I think that's not, that's true of not just staff and board members, um, but it's true of everyone, it's true of families, um, it's just been an unusual time. So I just invite all of us, board members, district and school staff, parents and students, um, our entire community to just kind of reach out together in understanding and compassion. Um, and I know that, um, and like in our personal lives and then as society, right, as adversity comes, it can either build or it can tear down um, and I know that we have a community that can and will build together and we will come out as a stronger and better district and community. Um, so that's all I have for my comments. On to um, Superintendent, Dr. Gallagher. Thanks, Michelle, that was great. Thanks, Michelle. So before I get started, I wanna congratulate Dr. Dean. She has a son who's going off to college tomorrow 
And we're very proud of Cameron. And of course, we're very proud of Tasha and her family. So congratulations, Tasha. Um, Tasha, you want to cry with me? <laughs> <laughs> Tasha, I think we're used to having them home, like home. And then they leave, it's hard. Yeah. <laughs> Tasha should be very proud of her son, Cameron. He's a wonderful kid. Um, board, I've told you that we've been having regular meetings with um, the superintendents of Cupertino and Fremont High School District, and they're really becoming great collaborative meetings. Today, I found out that in the Fremont High School District, um, a group of kids who are very passionate, actually recent graduates, um, which are essentially our kids too, um, have put together um, a very positive anti-racism video focusing on um, racism in the Fremont High School District, which um, is applicable, of course, to our schools as well. And so I got to see a preview of it today. When it's, there's a final version, I'll certainly share it with you. The high school district's also planning on putting together a series of lessons on this topic for their kids that all kids will get. And um, I asked Polly uh, Bove to share that with us so that we can, we can build towards that too and, and really collaborate on that issue. So I think that's a good opportunity for a partnership. I want to remind you that the back to school assembly is uh, this coming up Monday, the 17th. I can't believe it's almost here at 8.30 on Zoom. And the theme is learning together, arriving as one. And everyone gets one of the, oh, you can't really see it. You get one of these um, wristbands um, with that theme. And on the inside, it has um, our hashtag, we are Sunnyvale School District. Um, and so that's just like a little unifying um, emblem that we're gonna work hard to make sure that everyone gets and that everyone remembers that they're part of the team and we'll, we'll have them for you as well. Um, thanks to Aaliyah for, for coming up with that idea. Um, let's see. Um, the North County Resource Fair, um, just wanna remind you about that. That is this Saturday at the Columbia Neighborhood Center. Um, that is a resource fair focused on our unhoused families. Actually, not just ours, we're, the, we're one of the focal districts. Um, we're one of the sponsoring districts, but um, it's sponsored by our district, the city of Sunnyvale, um, the Santa Clara County Office of Education, the Columbia Neighborhood Center, I think someone else, I'm probably forgetting. Um, Jeremy has worked very hard to put this together um, and it should be a really good event. We had huge dreams on this one, but we scaled them back a little bit just because of, um, of COVID. But, we're confident that the resources will get to our families. So if you're interested, you could stop by um, the Columbia Neighborhood Center on Saturday from nine to three. Um, I, I, have a, I have a question about, go ahead, Nancy. I had a question about that. Oh, I thought it said that you needed to take appointments on the flyer there that I saw. Well, I mean, you could go as an observer. Oh, okay. Yeah, as an observer, yeah. Yeah. So when it's uh, resources, is it like referral resources or is it like services there? Like, will there be things there for them that day? Jeremy's leaning in. Why don't you take this one, Jeremy? Yes. Uh, great question, Bridget. Um, a little bit of both. So again, Mike said it was going to be initially a lot of service providers and vendors to provide direct service there. Um, we had dreams of, you know, food and haircuts and dance and music, but we've scaled that down. So it's a little bit of both. So we're, um, every participant will receive um, a packet of information. And so all of the community-based organizations that couldn't attend because they couldn't staff in person sent resources and vouchers and transportation things. In addition to that, um, we are having district staff as well as uh, Sunnyvale Community Services staff on hand to do individual casework to really help these families navigate actually whatever they need. So we tried to balance that um, in a safe COVID friendly uh, uh, physical distancing, so. So good, Thank you. thanks. Thanks again for Jeremy for really spearheading that. That's a wonderful activity. We've never, it's never been done in this part of the, of the county. They did it in South County and I think in San Jose. So it's great to bring those services to, to our community. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about um, the COVID-19 um, update, which will be part of our agenda today. Um, each of the cabinet members will share um, a little bit about what they've been working on. We're right in the middle of, of the work. Um, Michelle, I appreciate what you said about how hard everyone's been working um, without their usual rests or breaks. Um, our, we have an incredible team. Um, so each will share a little bit just to give you an idea. And then of course, there'll be time for you to ask questions. 
One of the topics that I'm really proud about, and I'll be honest, a little bit anxious about, is our independent study program. Um, Tasha has done an amazing job um, envisioning this and putting it together and recruiting teachers and recruiting families um, or offering it to families who are interested. And um, it's really exceeded our imagination for not only in the interest of the teachers, but also in the interest of the families. So uh, I understand there was a meeting tonight and um, we're right in the middle of the process. I wanna assure families that we're gonna do everything we can to get all the families into the program that are interested. It's true that we have now just over 400 um, students interested in the program and we have about 200 slots. Now, what we're experiencing is um, many parents have all the information they need and they're ready to go and they're ready to sign up and when they hear those numbers, they get frustrated. We don't want them to be frustrated because many others, the more information they hear, um, they find out that's not exactly what I want. I think virtual school will be a better option for me. So what we're going to do is we're gonna be seeing um, how all the numbers shake out. Um, we're gonna, tonight was the information meeting to really gauge after we give parents all the information, how much interest there is. Um, we will absolutely explore adding sections of this to meet the need. Um, we, we think we're gonna actually end up pretty close to being right there, um, but we're also developing options for adding additional sections because we really want um, to meet the need of, of all families. So um, Jeremy and um, Tasha can talk a little bit more about that when we get to the um, COVID-19 update section of the agenda. And that would be the time for parents if they're here and have questions to, to address those as well. But again, the message is we really wanna accommodate everyone we can. When we started this, we thought like, oh, maybe there'd be 50, 60 parents in three or four sections. Um, but it's really been more than that, which we're excited about, but we really wanna be committed to meeting the need as best we can. So with that, those are all my comments. Thank you, Mike and board. Um, we are now on to item four, comments from the Sunnyvale Education Association. I saw Wendy's in the room. I'm not sure she wanted to speak. Yeah, she just yeah. raised her hand. Okay, Wendy. Welcome, Wendy. You should be All here. right, hello. Um, this is just to go along with Mike's comment about being part of a team. And I just really wanted to thank the district and Mala, I wanna really extend a thank you to you for the PD that was um, offered this last week. And just the, you know, it was a testament to the fact that there was just this record number of attendance of teachers, teachers presenting and teachers taking those trainings. Um, I attended them as well and, you know, worked on one of them. And I just can't say enough about um, the dedication of our staff and how hard teachers were working to get as much knowledge as possible about some of the new technologies or maybe some technologies that they weren't quite quite proficient in. So that was exciting to see and um, I really appreciate the district putting that together for our members and I know that teachers are scrambling, you know, to try to provide the best possible virtual learning experience for our students and that was kind of um, an example of the dedication that teachers have to it. I also wanted to thank Jeremy for the work that he is continuing to do with SEA and helping solve some you know, big issues when it comes to the virtual learning. And one of those issues is for teachers with children. And I appreciate you working on that with us. And one thing I've really learned is that not all parents are trained teachers, but most teachers are parents. And so it really does um, present a difficult balance with virtual learning between home and school when you're providing instruction all day to somebody else's child but you still have to provide instruction to your own child. So Jeremy, just thank you very much for working with us on that. And the lines of communication had never been more open between SEA and the district than they have been through this whole um, pandemic. And we're just very appreciative of that. We look forward to working with you going forward. And I know that we're gonna be working on that MOU in a couple days. And um, I, none of it's a big surprise because we've kind of been working on it the whole time anyway. So Jeremy's just putting it together and with the language, I guess I should say. So anyway, thank you for that. And we look forward to a great year and um, starting off on the right foot. And I know I have a lot of faith and belief in our teachers and I know that they're gearing up to just do the best that they can possibly do. So thank you. 
Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Wendy. Please pass along to all of the teachers from all of the board um, our appreciation to all of them, and we we are here to support you. And I don't know what the word is like. We're we're here to be your cheerleaders. We thank you for all that you guys do. Um, on to uh, item five: comments from the California School Employees Association. Ali, are you seeing him in the participant list? Okay. I'm not. Okay. We will just give it just a moment, but I think probably not somebody here. So we will now move on to um, item six, comments from the public. Um, as a reminder, per board policy, meetings of the governing board are conducted for the purpose of accomplishing district business to encourage community involvement in the schools board meetings shall provide opportunities for questions and comments by members of the public. The board shall limit the total time for public input on each item to 20 minutes. Um, with board consent, uh, the board president may increase or decrease um, the time allowed for public presentation, depending on the topic and number of persons wishing to be heard. Um, so now is the time for public comment on items that are not on the agenda. So if there are people who are wishing to speak to an item that's on the agenda, then there will be an opportunity for public comment when we get to that agenda item. So if there's anyone interested in um, public comment on any items not on the agenda, um, then please use the raise hand feature now. And I believe, um, Kim Moya, so it might be the only one right now, but yes, Kim Moya has something she would like to share. So we'll go with her and then if, we'll give everyone else a few minutes as she's talking, if they want to make a comment. Of course, I'm always the one getting in trouble. Um, hi, you guys, I'm Kim Moya. I'm a Sunnyvale teacher and I'm a Sunnyvale resident. And tonight I just wanted to take a minute before you get to all of your agenda items. And I wanted to recognize um, one of our community members who happens to be in the meeting today. Um, this is a person who stepped up um, to help the Sunny Sunnyvale School District when we went into the pandemic. She organized a paper bag collection at her home and distributed paper bags to the Sunnyvale sites that needed them to be able to get meals. I see you smiling there to get meals um, to students who needed um, to get the meals that the Sunnyvale School District has been um, making for them, which was a big thank you to the Sunnyvale School District as well for continuing that. She found out that there was a shortage of masks and she ended up getting her sewing machine out and learning how to sew. And she made masks and she handed them out to people who needed them. She connected with Home First, which is our Sunnyvale uh, shelter where we have a lot of our children. Um, and she worked with them um, to do so many things. And I have a letter here. I don't want to waste a lot of time reading it, but there were a couple things in the letter that I just wanted to mention. She was talking about how this person is changing the landscape for the children and the families that we serve in Sunnyvale. They said, when somebody in our community steps up and helps to be a voice to our most vulnerable citizens, they're building trust and a foundation to grow from. We simply could not do the work we do without this person in the world. So I thought that was a really cool thing. I'll be giving you that too, giving you that letter. Um, as a token of my appreciation, I mean, I just met you in, didn't even get to meet you. I met you virtually when all this started happening just by seeing your posts on different social media. And I just, you, made me step up and want to help because when this first happened none of us really knew what to do we were all sort of scared and at home and not wanting to get out and and i thought there's got to be something i can do here and i put a couple boxes out in the front of my house with with notes on them and my neighbors put paper bags in them and my husband drove them to your house and you know i we got into it we started doing you know what you needed you brought us together um, Reed had suggested that something that would be nice to give you is a word cloud. 
And um, so I got to learn how to do one of those. That was fun. And I have one for you. I will put it at your house, contactless. I'll, I'll put it on your porch. But some of the words that are in your word cloud, and I actually ran out of spots to put it in because there were so many generous, kind-hearted, approachable, inspiring, caring, service-oriented, an organizer, a community supporter, a volunteer, a mask maker, energetic and friendly. There are many more I could have added into that. I just wanted to publicly thank you um, for stepping up. This person is Bridget Watson. She is actually on our board. She's in the room and there needs to be more positive things happening here. And this is one of those things that we really felt, the whole board felt that I needed to step up and say something as a community member um, to thank you for all that you have done. Everyone stepped up above and beyond. And I just, I was able to connect with Bridget to be able to see personally some of the things that she had done. The fact that I've only known her since March means she's probably done so many more things that I have no idea, right? You're just amazing. So I just wanted to thank you publicly. Thank you. Yay, Bridget. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. That was very sweet. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Kim. All right, it looks like um, um, there are no other public comment. And then I also, um, I forgot to mention at the beginning, um, reminder that we are, we have interpreters for Spanish. Um, so it's probably mostly a reminder for me because I speak too fast, but um, try to speak um, slowly for the interpretation. And my device is closed. We are now on to item seven, uh, presentations. We have one, it's a report on the standards-based grading. And that is uh, Jonathan Watts. Thank you for being here with us tonight. Hi, no problem. As I try to avoid my uh, blinds, which I closed, and then now I've got this ray of light that I kind of have to dodge. So hopefully you can see me okay. Uh, but I'll be sharing my screen. That might make things a little bit more visible. Um, okay, so let me see if I have screen sharing privileges here. All right. So today I'm going to be talking to you about um, what we accomplished this last year with our standards-based grading committee. So we had that committee all of last year, and then I think we were actually kind of shooting for around March um, to, to kind of recap what we had done for the year, but that didn't work out so well. Um, so we are doing this now. Um, so I'm gonna go over the team, kind of who, who made up this team, um, the work that we set out to do, and then talk about some of the major things that we delivered. So the four point rubric, some background, some key components, um, and then some additional resources, and then looking forward to uh, training and how this communication and this work is gonna continue. So last year we formed the standards-based grading committee at the beginning of the year. Um, we had around 20 members, so we had some coaches. It was pretty much an open group for administrators or coaches to also pop in different meetings. So we wanted to get a range of everyone that we could and all the voices that we could um, from our staff. So all of the grades were represented, all of the sites were represented. We tried to hit all the departments. We tried very hard in recruiting the right people uh, to make sure that we had a really diverse group um, along with this work. So all together we had five whole group committee meetings. Um, most of the, the group meetings we started with a couple of readings because we needed to kind of build our background on what standards-based grading is, trends in standards-based grading, um, and then there were so many moving components of this. There were rubrics, we wanted parent guides, um, we needed to talk about the different labels, the descriptions of those labels, what our current grading practices are, where we came from. Um, so we had, we had so many different things to cover. So each, each session kind of started with some professional development and then a breakout through stations where we talked about and had more intimate discussions on these different topics. 
So what we accomplished this last year was um, really coming together to talk about what our philosophy is behind standards-based grading um, and what the current research and trends are saying about standards-based grading. We looked at the history of how did we get here? What, what grading practices have we had over time in Sunnyvale? What kind of training did we have? And wait, maybe what, what areas did we have to improve on in aligning our grading practices? We also created, the main thing was creating that four point rubric with clear labels and descriptors and then having a supportive narrative so that all of those conversations that we had don't get lost in future years. We also created some support documents for parents and a website for teachers because we're gonna to have to think about how we're onboarding every year and how um, throughout the year when we're meeting and we're doing collaborative grading practices, what reference do we have? So we took all of our discussions and different information and organized it on a training website for teachers um, so that this is a constant ongoing reference that we can also add to um, as we get new example rubrics or uh, departments come up with rubrics that are aligned to our practices that we can add on there. So the four point rubric, what we were looking for um, in creating this rubric was labels and descriptors that matched our standards based grading philosophy. Um, and we needed those labels to be anchored in standards and we needed it consistent and clear. So some of the reading that we talked about, um, there was a book that we referenced quite a bit that talked about this large study they did with parents in varying grade levels. Um, and they asked them about different different labels. So they showed them different labels and they talked to them about different labels that they used and the perception of these things. And a lot of times I think in education, we tend to use uh, educational jargon and it just becomes our normal language. But to parents, sometimes that it, it doesn't mean anything. Um, so one of the examples that really sticks out in my mind is the label emerging. So we use that term a lot in education. Emerging is, you know, you're beginning, you're just in the foundations of something. Um, but this parent group that surveyed, one of the quotes that was out of that talking about inconsistent or clear labels, um, they said emerging brings like a monster, like a slimy monster coming out of the lagoon. Um, and that's what they pictured when they pictured emerging, which is much different than what we think of when we use that in education. So that really stuck with me that we need to use clear language that is not coded at all in any sort of educational jargon and consistent going from label to label. Um, so the best way to do this, I think, is I have two short videos that I'm going to show you. This first one just goes over some of the key components of standards-based grading. Um, and it's about a minute long. And this is also the video that I put on um, the website. So one of the things that I definitely promised the standards-based grading team was that we would never share just the rubric alone, that there would always be an accompanying video or description or something that really captures all of the conversations that went into making something that can seem really simplistic, um, but there's so many discussions that we had about this. Um, so this is one of the videos that we came up with. Before we get into an explanation of a four point rubric, it's important to understand some key components of standards based grading in Sunnyvale School District. To start with, the grades you're reporting to students and families on the report card should represent the current or most, most recent understanding of the standard in question. It's important to note that within this concept of current understanding, that this means for some more complex standards, you may only be grading a portion of that standard itself and you are not grading based on end of year expectations. An example of what this means in practice is that if the student started out the trimester with little to no understanding of the standard, but then by the end of that trimester demonstrated a complete understanding with no conceptual errors, this student would receive the top proficiency level of a four. Their earlier misunderstandings should not count against them. And the opposite is also true. If a student starts out the trimester with a complete understanding of the standard, but then as that standard grows in complexity, the student starts to show some conceptual misunderstandings, their grades should also reflect this current level of understanding. Another key component of standards-based grading is the separation of what we call in Sunnyvale lifelong learning skills. These are the factors that they're important to report to students and families, but they're not directly tied to their understanding of the academic standards. Some examples from our different grade level report cards include homework, attendance, behavior, or I think it's worded organization of self. These all contribute to student learning, but should be reported separately from any content related assignments or assessments that are entered into the gradebook. 
This helps students and families recognize the specific areas they need to focus on. All right, it's always weird in a presentation showing a video of myself presenting, um, but I feel like I, I did okay there. So it's easier if I just play myself. Um, okay, so this one goes into a little bit more about the actual rubric. So the discussions we had about the labels, um, and then those two layers that I talked about of the descriptions of each proficiency level. This video is going to go over Sunnyvale's four-point rubric, which is used across the district to score student work and guide in the creation of task-specific rubrics you may be using in your own classroom. The four points and the headers across the top will also appear on each grade level's report card. Starting with the labels for each proficiency level, you'll see consistency in the naming convention. The standards-based grading committee reviewed handfuls of various labels from neighboring districts, state and local assessments, and pretty much any example of proficiency or rubric labels we could get our hands on. Through several group discussions, we decided the labels needed to be consistent across each level, easy to read and understand, should use clear language and be anchored in the fact that we are grading on standards. Out of these discussions and set criteria, we landed on the following labels. Standard not met, standard partially met, standard nearly met, and standard met. We believe these labels clearly articulate the level of student understanding and match the description and philosophy behind our established grading practices. Below the proficiency numbers and labels are two rows of brief descriptions providing additional information about each proficiency level. The first row describes the range of conceptual understanding of the standard for each proficiency level. In this row, a score of a one is described as having many conceptual errors that impede understanding. This means that the student does not have a grasp of that standard. On the opposite end of the rubric, a four is described as having no conceptual errors and minimal errors that do not impede understanding. This means that the student has a complete understanding of whatever portion of that standard you've taught so far. They may have some small errors in their work, but it's important to note that these minimal errors do not impede their understanding. So in math, for example, a student may have occasional computational errors, but these errors are not due to a lack of conceptual understanding. They get the standard, but just made some mistakes. Proficiency levels two and three, standard partially met and standard nearly met, are essentially inverses of each other. A two means that the student is showing some beginning understandings of that standard, but mostly doesn't get it. The three, on the other hand, shows that the student mostly gets it, but still has some conceptual misunderstandings that are holding them back from the top proficiency level of a four. So in short, a one is not really showing understanding. A four is proficient on what you've taught so far. A two is mostly not getting it, but showing some beginning understandings. And a three is mostly getting it, but still has some misunderstandings holding them back from that four. Throughout each proficiency level, and especially in the top proficiency level, it was important to the standards-based grading committee to include the varying degrees of conceptual errors. As we work on having a growth mindset with our students, it's important that this is also reflected in our grading practices. Just as professional sports players, who would probably receive a four in most cases, can make occasional mistakes and benefit from additional coaching, our students too should be allowed mistakes in their work. The difference between the mistakes at a one and a four level, though, is the degree to which those mistakes reveal a true conceptual misunderstanding. The last row of our rubric is a description about the level of support needed. When we assess student work, we should be looking for independent mastery of the standards. What can they do on their own without assistance? But at the same time, the standards-based grading committee had a lot of discussions about how certain supports are acceptable and can still be used independently to show mastery of a standard. Consider driving your car to an unfamiliar location. We often rely on our GPS or a map to assist in our driving. This doesn't mean that we're not proficient drivers, but just that we benefit from the assistance of this tool or support. Similarly, on the subject of time management, meeting deadlines, waking up in the morning, arriving on time to scheduled meetings, we all benefit from using certain tools to help us be proficient in these areas. The thought behind this descriptive row in the rubric is that it's important we accept the use of certain tools to assist in learning, but that the students should be able to select these tools and know which tools assist in their learning on their own. So when the description changes across proficiency levels from substantial support to minimal support, 
we aren't counting the number of tools used, but more the independence of the student in recognizing and selecting these tools. Were they able to identify a graphic organizer that helps them in their writing, for instance, or were they unable to start writing unless someone else intervened and suggested a graphic organizer for them? In the analogy of driving or time management, are you able to consistently set a time or calendar event to remind yourself to be punctual? Or do you require occasional, frequent, or substantial intervention from others reminding you to set a time or use a map to meet these standards? I'm also not a very big sports fan, um, so I hope that analogy worked. <laughs> I just chose random teams. I'm not even sure which, which sports teams, and I think that was a coach but I'm not 100% not positive there. Okay, so that was the rubric. That was kind of the gist of the rubric explanation. I feel the video probably did it better than I could do live. Um, so some additional resources that we came up with to make sure that all of this work that the committee put in is continued and that we still are going to have this discussion and that we're not gonna lose all of this um, really went into that website. So I tried to capture that with, um, we have a frequently asked questions page. So a lot, of, a lot of the discussions that we did at the meetings, the teams would go back and share with their department or they would share with their grade level um, and we would receive feedback from them. So this is because anytime you're instituting a change or even a slight change, um, you're gonna have a lot of questions. So we tried to get as much of that as possible and then address it through different communication, but also making sure that I address it on this website so that moving forward, um, we still have that as a reference. So this is an example of the, the two videos that I just showed. Um, this is a page on the website which has an explanation of the rubric, kind of our history that I talked about in of grading in Sunnyvale. Uh, the frequently asked questions. There's a section that describes standards-based grading versus traditional grading, which is what most of us grew up with, the A through F straight percentages. Um, the parent guides to the report card and then report card comment guidelines, which is more geared toward elementary where they write comments to um, supplement the grades. So this is an example of one of the parent guides to the report card. Um, I'm not sure if you can see it too well on the right there, but what this does is um, on our report card, we report our standard strands, we call them, which are more like the headers kind of for that area of standards. So an example would be um, any of the bold lettering that you see here. So like reading foundational skills. So on the second grade report card, the parents just see readings foundational skills, and then they see a grade attached to it. But they may not know, unless you're an educator, you may not know what foundational skills are or what, um, like in math, there's one that's operations and algebraic thinking. So what this does is it breaks down um, what's on the report card and then the actual standards that go into that. So we're hoping this will clear up some confusion about what standards are being covered. And also, hopefully, it'll encourage parents to have discussions with the teachers and say, you know, which area could you show me? Which area maybe I could, um, I could support at home? Or what is, the, what is the place that, you know, the specific standard within reading foundational skills um, that my student really needs to work on? And then aligning our grading practices. So um, during each trimester, we offer a day where the, the teachers are able to get together and work on um, collaborative scoring of writing assessments um, and creating different class specific rubrics. So part of that this year is definitely gonna be looking at our four point rubric and this website, the references, and then coming to an agreement together. So they are aligning all of their grading practices. And moving forward, um, in the beginning of the year, all of the site principals are gonna be giving this information to parents through um, hopefully as many means as we can, the different methods of communication that we have. So a lot of them, like even at the beginning or at the end of last year, you know, there was a lot of coffee. Um, so we can still do, you know, PTA meetings and uh, coffee with the principal and all of these things can still happen virtually. So we're gonna be sharing this um, throughout the year to continue to educate parents and let them know what's going on. Um, and I did want to just go over really quick the frequently asked questions. Let me see if I can just open my blinds because I feel like I'm, I'm being interrogated and sitting in this very dark room here. 
There we go. Okay, now it's gone away a little bit, the little lines across my face. Um, so one of the one of the common questions that that comes up, um, especially at the middle school level, I feel like, and also from parents that have um, high school age students or students that are going into high school. So one of the things that comes up a lot is how are we working to prepare our students for the letter grades and the changes in grading policies that they'll find in high school, which is a really important and valid question. Um, I'm not going to read exactly from here, but this is on our training website also. So these are a bunch of the different questions that have come up. So a discussion that I was having recently with someone that um, worked at a high school was she was using an example of how very frequently in high school, depending on the class, each class can kind of set their own um, percentages, like of what type of assignment counts towards your grade. So for example, in some classes, attendance and participation may count as 50% of your grade. Um, or maybe one final assessment can pretty much make or break your grade for the whole class. So they were using the example of a high school student that um, normally does pretty well and would be your typical A student, but they maybe had a bad day or some unfortunate circumstances on the day that they took their final. And so they didn't do so well in their final. So that actually dropped them from an A down to a D. And the question that was posed to me was, how are we preparing students for that? Um, and at the time they were implying that we should make our grading practices match that to be able to prepare them. But I would argue that most people would look at that scenario and say, that's not right. I don't think one test should bring you from an A to a D. It is a reality and we need to make sure that we educate our families and our students about the reality they're gonna hit in high school. But, but changing our grading practices to prepare them for that reality shouldn't be the way that we do it. We shouldn't have to match their inequities so that we prepare them for those inequities. Just as in life, there's a lot of really unfortunate circumstances that can happen, um, things that we can run into and a lot of inequities, but we don't, we don't choose to immerse our students in those inequities in order to prepare them for that. We talk to them about it, we have discussions, we get them. So I would, I would say that at the eighth grade level, we need to have discussions early about what it might look like in high school. And we also need to teach our students to advocate for themselves and communicate with, they need to have the confidence to be able to talk to each teacher and understand their grading practices. They need to understand, is attendance your main thing? Like is attendance going to be 90% of the grade or is it that one final? because that A student that dropped down to a D with that one final probably didn't know that that test was really going to make or break his high school career. So I think it's the education around that and there's a lot of different ways we can do it, but I very strongly don't believe that we should mirror in our grading practices those inequities to prepare them for that. Any questions? Go ahead, Reed, yeah. Um, Jonathan, thanks for addressing the high school issue. And I agree with you in terms of inequity, like we don't want to perpetuate inequity just to, just to teach them a lesson. But I guess, you know, having two students that are high school and college age, they both really felt at a disadvantage when they started in the high school. Um, coming from standards-based grading and moving towards letter grades because they just didn't understand the concepts that being at, being late or being absent or um, cumulative grading was going to affect their grade um, or behavior in class. I mean, these are all things, and you're right, we can teach them, but, and if we can actually do a lesson on how letter grades work, how traditional grading work for our eighth graders, maybe that would do it, but I'm telling you, that our students that come from our district, when they go into high school, it's, it's a tough transition for a lot of kids because sometimes it's inequitable, sometimes it's not. I mean, the difference is in high school, everything's cumulative. And so when we're doing standards-based, like you said, it's not, which is great because that means that once they learn it conceptually, they're not punished based on the past, but in high school they are. So they need to understand that every single thing they do matters and it's not okay for them to learn the hard way. Like they, they get in and they learn the hard way at first, you know? So personally, like I would love to see eighth grade switch to traditional grading, not because I want to perpetu perpetuate inequities, but because this is the way the world works for them in high school and college. So 
we're sort of doing them a disservice by being so equitable because we're teaching them that even if you screw up for the first, you know, whatever in class, as long as you understand it, you're fine. So there's kids that are like brilliant that can get away with not doing a lot of work, but they understand it so they can prove that they know it, then they're going to get straight fours. But then they get into high school and they start blowing off high school homework because they know that they get it and that they, they're going to be fine. They're not fine. They're going to get a D or enough. So anyway, that's just kind of the way I feel. Um, I know if you talk to high school kids, I think they'll share that, that it was hard for them. Most of them, I've talked to a lot of them and I've asked a lot of them about this when we've been going through this over the past couple of years. Um, I love standards-based grading from, from the fact that it is equitable. And Michelle and I went to um, a session at AEC last year on grades and it was just terrible how when they were showing the letter grades and they were giving scores and they were asking all of us to raise our hand with what we would give those students based on their past scores, everybody had a different answer. I mean, there were not, there was never alignment in terms of what, how we would grade those students. So I get that. But I also will tell you that our kids are at a disadvantage compared to other students that come into high school. Oh, I'm talking so fast. I'm so sorry. Um, our, they, our kids are at a disadvantage coming into high school when other students have had traditional grades and they don't have to make that next adjustment. There's already so many adjustments for them. So it's just an added adjustment that can make it harder them. So that's all I wanna say. But I wanna say your presentation was awesome. You've done tons of homework. I love the group that you put together. I love that you looked at the definitions of um, how, how you're gonna describe the grades. I think it's gonna make it really easy for the teachers to be fair with the descriptions. And um, I know when we first started standards-based grading, there were teachers that would, at the beginning of the year, give kids one, 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 then two, 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 then three, literally, like I, on my kids, they, they would start like three, 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 the first semester, then four, 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 then five, five, five at the end. And I know you're doing a really good job of ensuring that both our, our teachers and our parents understand that that's not how this is supposed to work. And, um, and that's great. So I don't want to be all negative. There's a lot of really good stuff about it, but that's just my one point. I had a question. Oh, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Bridget. Uh, my there was a question in the packet review that I didn't I didn't hear the answer to, um, which was, um, what are the other districts around us doing for grading? And I I don't necessarily mean um, every district in on the plan. I'm thinking of the other ones that feed into the high schools to Reed's point. So, yep. do you know what uh, Cupertino and the other ones are doing? I believe they are doing A through F. I think a lot of middle schools are doing um, A through F traditional grading. I see. Mm -hmm. And then my other question was for the um, video that you made, which I love, by the way, I just love the videos because um, they're very clear. Um, are those videos intended to be shown to parents as well or are they just intended to be internal? I think that they actually are fine to share with parents. I think that that, um, I don't know, I'd ask your opinion, but I think that, I think it's pretty clear. I, I don't think there's any sensitive information and I, I want it to be as transparent as possible what, um, what our grading practice looks like. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, I think it'd be a great resource. So as a, as a mom of a high schooler and a former high schooler, I guess I would say, I would agree with Reed in, in so far as it is a big adjustment in high school and it's shocking to them that if they just miss a couple assignments, their whole grade can be like, and just like measly assignments. Like, let's say you forget to lose, like, I don't, Ethan's gonna, Ethan's outside, I don't know. Ethan might be really embarrassed, but he would like misplace assignments, you know, like the, the backpack that you would find things in at the end of the semester, at the end of summer, there would be things, there's an assignment that he, from middle school that he was handing in. So, I mean, I think that it is very challenging for the middle schoolers to realize just how important it is to hand in their work. And that might be even just be the one thing that, that maybe somehow we could figure out how to emphasize more for them in middle school, just the importance of the assignments. Because I feel like if they're just in the, if that, that piece of it is just down in the lifelong learning skills, I, as a former teacher, I appreciate the standards-based grading and it's so clear and it's like, it's definitely about what they're learning. 
but that organizational piece becomes just more important as they get older. And um, I just wish that there was a way to, to make that more important somehow for middle school personally, Be because it is just so shocking to them. And it's not like they learn it immediately either. I mean, this is like years of behavior that they <laughs> like, things in I don't know how to, express that more yeah um so i have a um question comment um i appreciate um the video and i think that that would be an important component to have um out on our website uh to share with parents and so that parents can also share with their child but i'll give you a reflection it's not it, it's not standards base. It was happening with the the grades two, that that transition from middle school to high school and the and the change in the emphasis of rigor um, is shocking. Of how good is good enough? It doesn't matter what level the student um, is at. Um, it's that they're raising the bar again. Um, what this in uh, what this invites is to make sure that our um, two theater high school uh, freshmen um, uh, principals really work with the, with their staff to make sure that they're aware that not all students have had the paradigm of of um, the grade level or understanding that now. Um, different things have different meanings. So that that would be a conversation that we could have collaboratively uh, between our district and the high school district. Um, and I think that that would be helpful um, for their induction for uh, students, but parents as well, to have them have that level of awareness that little things matter um, uh, about the how good is, is um, uh, good enough, but I really appreciate um, the clarity and the equity um, component that this has. Um, I would also invite uh, the group to think about coming up with um, um, a sheet that could give parents a guide about questions you should be asking at your parent conference around the report card of, you know, some some um, quick um, things like you you had um, given a wonderful example Jonathan of saying oh well I see that this this standard is rated low what is it in this standard I think parents may not know how to take that next step um, and especially since we come from um, very um, diverse um, educational experiences of our parents and they may not have had a standard base um, practice to try and um, have an understanding of, of, of what the rubric for each different um, area means, um, that that would be um, an additional um, parenting education component that um, if we could build that in uh, with partnership and relationship, that would be um, important because even now, being in virtual um, communion with one another, we don't get those casual conversations to ask questions. So um, making it easier to know what to ask for um, and giving direction ahead of time would make um, the times that we do um, link up together that much more productive. Yeah, that's great, thanks. I really do like that idea of coming up and um, finding ways to educate you know, our families on how to advocate for their students, what questions to ask, um, you know, how to start productive conversations with the teacher. That's really good. I like that. I had a quick, but our, our, our conferences are now in September. You just mean like reviewing, like if people have questions about the grades? I think even in general, general, um, or on, on papers or tests or things like that. Yeah, I think just like, how do you, how do you follow up 
you know, on student work? What questions should you be asking um, teachers about your student learning? You know, like what, what conversations, how could you start a conversation um, and get that information? Because some parents may not know, you know, I don't, I don't know what to ask them um, when I see the, in, not even when I see the report card, but just in general work that might be returned, you know, um, what, what can I say to my student about the work and also what can I ask a teacher uh, that would be helpful? So most student work, and most, most teachers give out rubrics. There's rubrics for the major projects and the tests. So I'm sure that the teachers have all their rubrics in five point format now. So they'll just be changing. I mean, everything has to be kind of rewritten this year anyway. So they'll just kind of, the expectation is they'll take this year and as they go, they'll rewrite them as four point rubrics. Yeah, and we've had some of like as, team, as grade level teams or yeah, yeah, as grade level teams meet. Um, I know that during the summer, some of the departments had gotten together. Like I've joined a couple middle school departmental meetings where they've been talking about this. So like I just a couple days ago joined the science department at the middle school, and they were having a really good conversation about aligning just their. I mean, they went down to just one. They were taking like standard by standard, so they were looking at the lifelong learning standard. Um, of I think complete assignments and they were really analyzing that and talking about okay when we're talking about a four-point rubric and completing assignments during virtual learning what are we going to as a team decide like what how does this look let's really talk down the four three two one what is that going to look like and let's all agree on something um, so it's happening in different different teams for sure so is the idea this is going to roll out this year yes is, well do we think about have time to do it this <laughs> year? I mean, yes, I do. I am confident. I am confident in the work that our that our teachers are doing. Yeah. So, are we going to give them time to do it, like a little extra time, or like what's the thought on it with um? So we have staff we, development. We have a lot of. Yeah, so we have quite a bit of time embedded in our schedule. Um, on like elementary, we have the Wednesdays that has time for professional development. We just got done with elementary and middle school uh, principal meetings today where we talked to them about the major components that we must have happen in um, the various PDs. And one of them on the top of the list was standards-based grading for sure. Okay. And yeah. some of the work, can I just add one thing? Some of the work has already been done. So we've done the writing rubrics already for the elementary and uh, our coaches are also supporting and working on these. So we have some samples that they're using and just making minor tweaks and adjustments. So they're not all reinventing the wheel. <laughs> Great. Jeff, do you have any questions or comments? Um, I agree with a lot of the things that were said. Um, I like the points that Reed points out. Um, I'm trying to be careful here because as a high school teacher, I um, I often was highly critical of the subjectivity of grades, and then going into administrative, um, I saw some questionable practices on some syllabuses on the courses. I, I and I got me. Uh, it's actually interesting that uh, Jonathan talked about the standard about. Um, completing assignments because I found that a lot of the syllabuses and grades were handled and uh, were they elevated or weighted performance rather than content knowledge heavier. And it almost seemed like they were using grades as a um, classroom discipline device more than a content standard. I'm really proud of the work our district has done on standard-based grading. And it's, I think it's raised the level of, of uh, professionalism, the conversations among the teachers, and I think our teachers are really well developed in the content areas. And I, I'm actually kind of really cautious about implementing or the idea of grades um, because I, I don't, I'm actually wondering if we look at it more flip. I think this is more of a high school problem because I know the high schools are always talking about that. Uh, how do you, I mean, as an alternative educa edu educator, I can't tell you how many students I saw that failed a course simply because they didn't do the homework, but they knew the content, they could pass the tests. And I think that's uh, just shady outright. Um, I, I hear the, the struggle of the students as they transition to high school, I, I get that. 
but I also will say that the, the students, it's, it's a wall uh, for middle schoolers. The, school, the students that are uh, coming into high school, it's a, it's a transition that sometimes uh, just unfortunately um, paves out the path that, the, that they're going to go through in high school, uh, whether they can adapt or not. And I don't think, I don't know how much grades really have to do with it. Um, I do, but I, I think that's an interesting conversation though. Um, but like I said, I, I wouldn't want to see us lowering our bar of standards. Uh, I'd like to see more of uh, working with the high school um, district to see if we can get that level of conversation raised. Thanks. Well, and also I think at the high school level, they're tracking assignments daily, right? Like, so every day you can see when people, and it can really raise a high level of anxiety with kids as well, because every day they're looking to, to verify, like, did I get every single? It really is a source of anxiety. I mean. High stress, right? Or I not checking because you don't care. You know? I used to get in some knockdown drag out fights with other teachers about participation grade. I mean, what, what's the standard? What's the rubric to your participation grade? And they never, I, I, the ones I used to get most frustrated about really had a hard time articulating their standard towards that. And yet it had a weight on their grade, you know? And, and to me, that's hard to justify that that's actually content rather than classroom discipline. And I think that would be unfair to punish a student grade wise because they, I would say that the student that's uh, not engaged in classroom, but knew the content, maybe there's an argument that may be made that he's bored, <laughs> you know, and that maybe we need to put, provide more challenging. Maybe he would, if he was a standard-based classroom, he'd get higher, um, he'd already be at the four or five level. But, but um, I think, and actually, I think that was an interesting point about educating our student, our, our parents on how to advocate for their students because I'm not trying to be a rabble rouser here, but maybe that is another device that we can use is how do you educate the, the, the parents to advocate for their student in high school with asking them questions on, you know, content level conversations, how that correlates to grade. You know, if my child knows all the standards, why are they failing? when maybe a C is a little more applicable. But again, these conversations can get me in trouble sometimes with my own, my peers. But <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Um, I'll just briefly add, um, I would echo what Jeff and kind of Nancy, that I think this is an opportunity, as Mike was saying earlier, that he already has started working with um, Fremont Union and Cupertino, that they're working a lot with a lot of areas. So I think this would be a great avenue or a great area for us to, for Mike to reach out and maybe other staff to start these conversations with them and kind of see, yeah, see where we can go to try to, try to build that bridge, right? Try to build that, um, I can't remember the wording, the wording Jeff used was really great. I don't know, maybe elevate or whatever, the wording Jeff had used was really great. I also liked um, what Nancy had said about that idea of like questions for, for families. Like I know sometimes, teachers that they're like back to school nights will have some questions in there. But if there was, especially now that we don't have our um, parent teacher conferences connected to when the grades come, it would be fantastic when the envelope with the grades goes home to the family that not only is there, you know, a page that gives explanation about the grades, but then a page that says, here are some questions you could ask your teacher, you know, to kind of help. Also then that helps facilitate conversations because I think there's a lot of good to our parent-teacher conferences in September but the one not good part about that is then when grades come that it's not necessarily an opportunity to talk unless parents are proactively looking at it. Um, thank you Jonathan. Um, is there any other board questions or comments before we open up to public comments? All right if the public has any um, questions or comments related to this presentation Please use the raise hand feature now. And I think we maybe have someone right now. So Leah, if you wanna start that. A reminder that um, uh, you have um, three minutes, um, but if your comments are less than three minutes, that's fine too. Yes, and thank you for waiting patiently, Jonathan Cohen. 
if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself, you should be able to ask your question or share your comment. I can try to unmute yourself too. I might go ahead and move on to Vivek and we could try to come back to you, Jonathan. Can you unmute yourself on your end? Actually, Ali, if I can jump in, uh, Mr. Cohen is a representative from El Camino Hospital. So I, I don't know if he was trying to prep himself for later. Oh, okay. Um, he is also free to comment on standards-based grading, but I believe he's here for the El Camino. <laughs> Okay, in that case, we will move you for now. And Vivek, if you would like to please ask your question. Yeah, you guys can hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. I'll try and go a little slower so that uh, the interpreter's life is a little easier. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to basically understand the thing that has not been covered in Jonathan's presentation is how it is it better than the grade system I have been getting for my daughter's report cards, right? Where they've been talking about proficiencies and leadership levels and this and that. And I'm struggling after listening to Jonathan's presentation that the same subjectivity that, that resided in the previous grade level can still be found in the new rubric. Primarily when you have to depend on words like few Errors, many errors, far away from standard, close to standard. I still feel that each teacher might use it to de define the way they want to. And the reason why I'm saying this is that multiple conversations that the peer group parents have had with the teachers, even depending on the various levels of education that teach, you know, parents may have, it is very difficult to understand why a child was a four versus five in the previous rubric or three and a half versus five. And I have never got a convincing answer. My point being, teachers, you know, ability aside, we may have to provide a more of an execution focus to this rubric where a teacher is able to explain to a parent on what was the basis for a three versus a four or a met versus non-met, not met, partially met, nearly met. Uh, unless you can quantify this, this will remain as a subjective assessment. That's what my feeling is, right? So that's my one point. Maybe somebody in this audience can, can talk about how will you make the execution better than the previous rubric. And the second point is I'm going back to what Reed was saying earlier. Unless you can change the game in the high school, I really don't know how we can compromise internally by really not preparing students for what is coming to them in terms of cumulative grading, right? And the cumulative grading is not a phenomena of high school only. You go to colleges, whether international or domestic, you find a similar stuff, right? So where are we drawing the line? Let's say tomorrow, Oh, we are able to overcome that fact that, you know, high school is something which is not e equitable. What about the, the colleges? And what about the work life where cumulative discipline is what, you know, wins you your, your trust in the end of your evaluation cycle, right? So I, I have up your thought, we, sorry. Right. We just need to think over that and then some, somebody can comment on why we are shying away from that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Jonathan, if you don't mind sharing a little bit, uh, I'm trying to recall back when we, probably about a year ago when, we, when you first came to us to kind of talk about this and giving the history of the five point, four point scale and kind of that subjectivity and how when we do it, this one, we're gonna hopefully give more training out, right? So it will be less, there's always probably some subjectivity, but if you could kind of comment on that a little bit, Jonathan, that would be great. Yeah, so I think to start with, um, our last rubric, what 
what was missing from that was really the articulation of what we considered being proficient or um, at each level. So there was written documentation from the original team that created the five point rubric. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't widely distributed over the years. The message had kind of gotten lost. Um, and the labels that we had for each one of those numbers didn't match the description. So that really caused a huge discrepancy. Um, so for example, I think the two was called approaching. Um, but, but what it was approaching is a whole nother question because the four was actually proficient, I think, and then the five was advanced. So that two is quite, it's, it's not really approaching, it's, it's approaching, approaching. Um, so our, our labels and our descriptions did not match at all. Um, so what we have now is labels and the descriptions matching. And I agree, there's always going to be a little bit of subjectivity in grading. Um, I would say, though, that our teachers are very good at showing evidence for these grades. So while it was commented that, um, you know, if you got a three on the report card, what makes up that three, you could go to that teacher. Our teachers have that data. So they would definitely be able to tell you where that three came from, what scores, what assignments, they can show you the standards that were worked on and why they got the three. So I would argue that our teachers do a really good job of doing that if you ask them those questions. Thank you, Jonathan. Looks like we have one more um, public comment uh, and yes. then we will wrap up for this agenda item. Yes, next up is Sochi. If you want to go ahead and unmute yourself, you can go ahead and ask your question. There you go. Okay. Sí, Sochil Chávez. Bueno, yo la verdad quisiera hacer un comentario acerca de cómo toman las faltas en cuenta. And if those of you needed to hear her in English, you would just click on the English channel on the interpretation. Okay, um, what I need to do? Uh, sorry. Um, okay, uh, puede ayudarme con la traducción? Uh, no lo escuché, perdón. Sí. Okay, perfecto. Uh, yo la verdad quisiera hacer un comentario. I want to make a comment in relation how do you take into consideration when a kid is not assisting to class one day because i feel that's unjust because some parents that were here illegally we sometimes need to go away of this country to renew our visas and go outside of the country and sometimes even we sometimes we don't want to travel we're not doing it because we're going on vacations it's an obligation but those absentees they're not they're considered like an any other person like a person that is on vacation and that's not our cases so i would like to know if there's a way to justify these absences because they're caused not by uh, you know, our desire is just because we need to go outside of the country to renew the visa. So I feel that's not just. It's, it's you know, you make it look like we're not being, that we're being neglected, that we're not acting the right way. And that's not what we do. Because it's because we need to go out because the country is forcing us to do that. And we need to go to a different country to renew the visa and to come again in. And that's not what I want to do. It's just I'm obligated to do it. So I would like to see if that's possible to be uh, rearranged and to be handled differently. It's not our fault. It's not the kid's fault. So I would like to see if we can change this a little bit and you can take that into consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Sochi, very much. Thank you. Um, I think that is an interesting question. Staff, I don't know if the best thing would be for someone to address that right now or get her contact information um, and follow up with her. 
So I don't know who it's staff, what we think would be the best way to move forward with that. I could reach out, um, falling kind of in the attendance realm. Um, Aaliyah, if you can help track down that contact information, we'll circle back. That would be great. I think because that is it, right? It's connected to grades, but also that attendance. And that is an interesting, um, sometimes attendance does affect grades and whatnot. All right, thank you. Board, is there any other um, final questions or comments before we move on? Are we good? It's hard, there's lots of faces. I'm like looking for everyone. I think we're good. Okay, um, I would like to um, suggest that we maybe adjust our agenda again. We have Larry Stone is on right now. Um, and I would hate to have him keep waiting. So if we want to make a motion to- I can adjust my motion, Michelle, my okay. motion for the agenda. So I can, Nancy, did you want to say something? Oh, oh. no, in a second, oh, you're- I'll adjust. finish. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'll adjust my motion about the agenda and I'd like to move um, approval of resolution supporting um, Proposition 19 to- uh, um, no longer see him in attendees. Sorry. Uh -oh. He's not I, here anymore. Can I just have a question on the end of the last thing really quick? I just was thinking about it. So the next steps are the teachers are going to start the rubric, the four point standards based rubric this year. And Mike is going to work with the high school district and the other districts that feed into it to just discuss aligning the middle schoolers to make sure or making sure the high schools align with us or something to try to ease that. Is that what I heard? Well, I put it on my next meeting agenda to talk to Polly about that, um, to see what their perception is of our kids coming in, um, what they can do, um, what their attitude is about grading, um, and see what connections we can make. Okay. All right. Thanks, Sarah. It, it, it looks like Larry isn't there. I look too, so I guess we'll just keep our schedule as is. Maybe he'll come back with us. Yeah, sounds good. Um, board, do we want to do a five minute break now before we go into COVID-19 updates or do we want to do that? Um, my suggestion is to power through COVID and then take a break after that. Okay, I will just say if Larry comes on though, we'll need to then go through that one before we take a break. Correct, correct. So it could potentially be like 45 minutes, hour-ish? It's been an hour and a half. Why don't we take a five minute break? Okay. Okay, sounds good. Okay. So let's do let's do a five minute break right now. It's eight twenty eight. Let's try to make it four or five minutes so we can really try to start back at eight thirty three. Thank you, everyone. Aaliyah, will you just check quickly to see if Larry's on there before we move on to the next item? Okay. Did we Back to Larry to see. Jesus is reaching out. He's trying to find the okay. info. All right, we will move on to um, 8A review and discussion COVID-19 updates. Dr. Gallagher. Okay, thank you. As I um, referenced in my comments at the beginning, um, we decided to put this, return this agenda item just as we had it in the spring. And you think back to how much is been done and undone and redone. And now just like really deep um, hard work by our, our teams um, in preparing for the school year. And we're right in the middle of the work as I referred to regarding independent study, but in everything else as well. So I thought what we'd do is just go through um, the cabinet members and have them give a very brief update on what they've been working on and what they are working on to kind of seed the conversation. And then of course, invite you to um, make any comments or ask any questions. So I'm just going to randomly call on Mala first. How's that? <laughs> Fantastic. I will go first. Thank you. Um, so the, you know, the whole uh, crux of the comments I'm going to make is uh, support. How are we providing supports um, to our staff, to our families, so that we can get to the opening of this unusual school year uh, with as much, uh, you know, for safety net as possible. Um, it really fills my heart to hear a teacher pay a compliment about Summer PD because it is for the teachers and designed by our coaches. So it's really fabulous. We had 
um, astounding attendance, uh, 541 last week and 618 that are signed up this week. So more than 1,100 teachers participating, um, which is just awesome. Um, we have um, resources uh, put together. So um, we had groups working in grade level teams and departments at the middle school uh, putting together for teachers. Um, what do the first two weeks of school look like? What does the whole trimester look like? What are the priority standards that we must address? What are some formative assessments that can be embedded into your work so that we're not spending valuable instructional time um, you know, assessing at the beginning of the year or doing benchmark assessments? We're really weaving that in um, to make it instruction for learning. Um, that's really important. Uh, most important, of course, is um, the focus on making connections, making connections with our students, making connections with our families, getting to know um, who we are, who we're serving, um, and finding ways to do that um, is another area that's really incredibly important. We know that it's not just the first two or three days of school that are critical, but also the follow-up. So we have the Wednesday schedule that has been established with um, some time for teachers to be able to uh, participate in ongoing uh, professional development. I'm looking for an alternative word, term to professional development because it's really about deepening and giving them time to collaborate and explore and look at all the resources that they have uh, because it's a phenomenal task that they're undertaking. Um, we have, um, that's on the staff end, on the parent end, uh, we have, um, I think Aliyah just referenced, we had a well-attended parent education session last evening on tech tools. Um, about 230 um, you know, were in attendance. Um, it was great. The responses were really positive. And it's just the beginning. It's also going to be ongoing at the site level uh, because we know this is a new way of learning and parents need support in how to support their students. Um, in addition, um, there's a family resources page that has uh, just been created um, and it has all the tech tutorials, it has videos, it has um, just all the resources that principals started putting together in the spring um, on setting up a safe environment, setting up a safe space for your child, a learning uh, space, what could it look like, what do you do if your child isn't paying, you know, just all kinds of different questions that parents had. So we put them all together onto this one um, resource page. Um, and um, that's about what we've been really busy doing <laughs> these last few weeks and are continuing to do so. Be happy to answer any additional questions you may have about this. Where, where is the resource page? Is that published yet on the website? Or? It will be. Will yes. be, okay. Just Great. put together. Um, yesterday. Wow, great. The parent education said when the questions were asked and it was Jonathan, um, let's put them all together. So we are now putting, pulling all the other resources so that it can be one stop. And we have um, someone in my department who's doing the translating. So it's available in Spanish and in English simultaneously. When you say it's going to be ongoing at the site level, like, what does that mean? Does it just mean like if somebody has a problem, they just call the office or is there like training? No, it's training. So we had the outreach liaisons um, attend these sessions as well so that they could be then taking it back to the site. Um, at the district level, we gave a very large, you know, one hour overview. Here are the tech tools. Here's what it looks like from the parent lens. Um, and then based on what the site is using, for example, we could have had middle school parents um, you know, look, just getting a snippet of Seesaw, it's not something that their students would necessarily be using. So then the Seesaw app tools would be promoted more and followed up more at the school sites. And then uh, they'd have training there. It's going to happen at uh, coffee with the principals, at, you know, evening meetings, just parent sessions, just giving parents an opportunity um, to learn more and deepen their knowledge on you know, what they want to need to learn more about. Um, so when they have the coffees for the mm -hmm. uh, families, it would be nice to have a link to that as well, um, since we're not going to be having the formal back to schools or anything along those lines so that we could be a, a visitor and see what's happening. Sure. They actually are going to have 
back to school nights. Oh, um, are? Principals okay. are, yeah, Molly could probably, uh, we were both in the principals meetings today. They're coming up with creative ways to make that still happen. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll certainly get you the information on that and we can get you the okay. copy with the principal also. Thank you. So Rob, why don't you go next? We're not getting anything, Rob. It looks like you're unmuted. Any better? That's it. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I was unmuted. I guess wrong microphone input. Sorry. So, anyways, um, you know, this summer was a typical summer for a portion of our staff, and then you know, very atypical for the balance of them. Um, our custodians cleaned the 375 classrooms around the district, our multi-uses, libraries, offices, restrooms, in the form where we would be typically anticipating the return of you know, our 6,300 students, all of the teachers, and the rest of the classified team. Um, so I was actually over at Cherry Chase today, and we had a bit of normalcy where um, we were doing the move, which you know we call it a move when you have new classrooms that are built and you move into a room. I was walking with some of the custodians at a, at a decent distance away, but we were, I was walking with some of the custodians as they were moving the furniture into these new classrooms and they were commenting on just, you know, in general, how I guess strange for them this is, right? Because they're getting ready to start having to um, chase after lunch times and all those sort of things. So really um, that's what they've been doing to prepare for um, school in general. We have PPE that's been distributed to the front office staff for distribution to staff and visitors. Uh, we have sneeze guards that are in the front office. Um, both face shields and um, disposable masks have been distributed. Uh, hand sanitizer has been put in all the front office areas and anywhere where there's not um, readily available access to water and soap. Uh, we are anxiously anticipating the 500 or so hand sanitizer stations that we ordered back in the springtime. Um, and then each of our custodial staff has been given thorough cleaning direction from our operations manager, Kathy Rouse. Something that you all may not know is actually Kathy has a hospital background. So, you know, she spent her career prior to Sunnyvale cleaning for health, which is, um, you know, kind of the, the most stringent level of cleaning, if you will. So this is something that, you know, she has a really deep um, level of knowledge on and is, is able to really provide consistent direction to each of the custodians at the school sites so that the level of service that that is expected and should be provided to each of the school sites will be consistent because you know, just like we were talking about with the grading standards earlier, you know, we want to have our cleaning standards be the same across the school site as well. So, um, you know, really just to make sure preparing for, for that and for our, the portion of staff that we will have on campus and again, the consistent offerings for them and then continuing to prepare for hopefully our students to return at some time in the not too distant future as well. So, thank you. If you have any questions. Okay, we'll jump to Jeremy. Yes, uh, I will speak at a Tasha pace. Um, and I liked how Mala put a theme to her. So the theme from HR and Student Information Services is partnerships. So on the agenda tonight is the El Camino Hospital MOU for um, a testing program for our employees. Um, in addition, as Wendy alluded, we are exploring childcare option with a partnership with the city of uh, Sunnyvale as well as I'm happy to say that Fremont Union High School District has joined us in those conversations as well. Um, we've been partnering with our um, actually management and employees um, to finalize our staffing assignments in this virtual world, um, utilizing all of the feedback we've received on the workforce readiness surveys to really make sure that everyone um, is accounted for, um, understands their duties in this kind of digital remote workforce that we're, we're um, employing now. Um, been partnering with Tasha a lot on the independent study, um, and so that's been a, a great a great piece. Uh, Mike touched on it in the North County Student Resource Fair. Again, that actually want to give a lot of credit to the district as a whole. Um, it, it takes a, it took a lot of moving parts to make that work. Um, everybody from uh, the site administration at Columbia Middle School, um, Rob's team, um, Kathy Rouse. Also, we've arranged um, for a 
bus on Saturday to go to the shelter in order to provide transportation for the families at the shelter to come over um, and just kind of making it a little, little bit of a special event as well. And then lastly, a partnership um, with our two employee organizations and our management association in negotiations as we open. Um, just so proud of our, our uh, Sunnyvale way, if you will, to have just flexible um, kind of keeping our eye on the, uh, what it takes for student success, supporting our students, families, and employees through this process. Um, so we are getting close to that, but I'll, yeah, I'll have more information on that in, in, in the future regarding our negotiations. So that is a, a summary of the information coming out of HR and as we prepare for opening in the COVID-19 world. Any questions? Read. Thank you. You really do have two jobs, Jeremy. That's a lot of stuff. Um, hey, quick question. What is our enrollment looking like? Are we losing a lot of kids? Are we, I'm so curious to know where we stand. Uh, again, as I, I've been talking to different principals and I feel like I'm a little bit uh, as an election person coming up. So with early returns um, and, and thank goodness all of the site admins or principals back because they're really helping to you know, verify enrollment. We look to be down about another 170 or so students um, from before. Um, so that's going to put us you know, south of six, maybe 600 and or sorry, 600, 6,250 um, but again, we won't know for sure until day one or day three. So. How'd I do, Tasha? <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, well, handing it over to Tasha, Mike, if that's, I guess, uh, thank you. All right. well, can I ask a quick question about um, the distance learning and independent study thing? So, um, uh, we have Tasha go first, so she's gonna probably talk oh, about yeah. it. Sure. Okay. Is it not answered? Perfect. Good evening, board. It's been a busy week and time for everyone, but we've been working together. Um, we figured out a way to snag a few dates, and so we were able to provide some training to our parents before the start of the school year. So we were pleased about that. It was really important for us to support them, but it was also very important to them. So we had those two trainings this week. Uh, we had a training on virtual best practices um, that took place yesterday. Uh, today, uh, they were engaged in a session on um, Zoom and how to best support their teachers and some of that work. Um, both sessions had over 80 uh, participants in each of them. And it seems like that feedback is coming back pretty positive um, from them. In addition to that, um, we have been working. Our psychologists returned on Monday. And we are so happy they have returned because um, they really are so vital at helping us to navigate and support our um, site administrators with some of the specialized programs at the site. So, They've jumped in um, and we have a few new sites, but they have really um, been full force. Uh, we've been looking at the site at how to plan for assessments, uh, looking at some uniqueness around some of the IEPs and things that we will need to look at as far as holding as well and facilitating some really unique needs that are there. And then they have been supporting with us to uh, set up uh, one on one meetings with parents who just really have some unique aspects to their students' programs. Uh, so that started this week, and we're right in the midst of doing that. So hopefully, those meetings will be able to, within the first week or two of school, all have been held, and specialty IEPs have been held as well. In addition to that, uh, Linda, Chen Chen, and myself have been working more specifically with the specialists. And in particular, looking at uh, researching alternatives to authentic assessments that we're required to do where some of the vendors really don't have a remote option available. So we're looking at alternative ways by which we might be able to set assess in particular for initial assessments and tries, triennial assessments, and, and um, working with the specialists on being sure that they're comfortable with teletherapy, um, and getting some coaching and training on those particular aspects of their jobs um, and letters going out to families to 
um, get their consent for some of the teletherapy services that will be provided. So um, those are some of the critical areas. And then lastly, of course, but not least for sure, is independent study. Uh, we've been really busy um, answering questions of parents and our new teachers who will be a part of the program. Uh, yesterday, we held a teacher um, initial orientation for those teachers, providing them some foundational information that they need to get started um, to prepare for the year. And then today, we held a targeted parent session on independent study, and we had nearly, um, I think, probably close to 200 participating in that um, this evening. So those are some of the aspects and programs and things that we've been working on. Okay, so can I ask my question now? Okay, so um, I was at the, I was at one of the, um, I attended, or I watched later. I didn't, wasn't watching real time, but I watched later um, the chair with the Cherry Chase uh, back to school meeting, and you know I think that um, something that's still confusing for some families it seems like is the idea of if and when we did transition to, you know, back to bringing children back onto campus, um, what happens with um, like the virtual school, um, if some kids want to stay doing a virtual school? And I think the answer was, is that the kids will be doing virtual school, but it might be with a different teacher if there's, if they're classroom teacher that they were having for virtual school goes back into the hybrid environment. Is that true? That right, you would be reshuffling at some point. I want to clarify because you used hybrid, virtual, and independent study. Right. And so, and then someone else was asking, uh, then that gets into independence. Independent study, as long as they're doing well in the program, the idea is trimester by trimester, they would in theory be able to continue all year. That is correct. In theory. And then um, for distance learning, virtual school, they would also be able to continue all year. However, if um, classes resumed on campus, that might mean that they would get a different virtual school teacher if their virtual school teacher went back onto campus. Is that correct? That's how it makes sense to me. I just want to make sure. I'm, I've got that correct. Yes. That that your, yeah. So they might just have to change teachers if they want to stay virtual school or vice versa. They, if they want to go back to hybrid, if their teacher is staying in virtual school and they want to go back to hybrid, they might join a different class to go back to hybrid when that's allowed. Yes. I think that was, um, the condition you're describing was what we were planning for back in way back in the early part of July, where there was the in-person, in maybe virtual and the independent study. So I would agree with everything that you're saying with the huge caveat that the actual numbers and conditions that would come in. Yeah, so I guess, yes, but you, I would say you said it very well. Okay. And then the other thing is, the other question is, is that they've committed to do virtual, they've committed to do virtual school for the term. However, if the child isn't doing as well in virtual school independently, that they may be moved to, I'm not, sorry, not virtual school, independent, independent study, they may be, if they're in independent study for the term, if they're not doing as well in independent study, as far as being able to keep up with the work or attending or whatever, then they would be moved into virtual school. That is correct. Okay. All right, I just wanted to make sure because I, I just wanted to, I thought that's what I heard and I, okay, thank you very much. So that depends a little bit on space availability. I mean, that's assuming that there would be space and you know, in most cases there likely would be. Um, but we, we just have to be flexible as we go through. I'm thinking about the question that Jeremy answered. It, like he said, it'll be, depend on the conditions at that moment. I'm, I've given up on predicting conditions. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, they would go to a virtual classroom somewhere, right? I mean, in the virtual world, it might not be 
a teacher that they know from their school if all those are in theory you know like it's just they're gonna not be in independent study anymore if they're not keeping up with the work right yeah okay thanks Reed, do you have a question or comment yeah um so Tasha, I'm just wondering if you could give an update, and this might not be you if independent study isn't happening, but I'm just wondering what's going on for our Juntos families who were you know, kind of struggling with not being able to be online for virtual school and wanting the independent study, but we couldn't do independent study. Um, so I'm just wondering if we've come up with any solutions for that. And then I wanted to ask probably Mike, or I'm not sure about um, if we're doing a waiver and if so, like what our plan is for that. For me, I'm going to turn the Juntos over to you and Mala, but... Um, um, yeah. yeah, so we're having, um, as we prepared for the staffing um, of the independent study program, we took special care in having conversations with the uh, San Miguel staff. They had the parent meeting the week and a half prior, and we even extended um, their deadline to return the information. Um, and so we're trying to look at different um, examples of how to support that side of the program uh, specific. So we have, still have a couple of options. Um, the Esteban's doing a great job of juggling this concept. And it's that we're trying to find um, the ability to support with the, the numbers of Juntos families opting for the independent study. So we, we need a little bit of, of, of returns tomorrow and then trying to figure out the best way to support um, that program uh, understanding that it is the same as the independent study in theory, but then, you know, the emerging aspect of it is something we're trying to make. But again, a caveat is if the numbers of the Juntos families, by worse uh, fear, if it comes in 1K, once, you know, one first, one second, one through one, like it just, th that would be very difficult to support. So. Um, but you're trying. That's we are. And so again, I just want to, I guess, to answer the, the intent of your, or the crux of your question, and I'm slowing down again, is that uh, we, we are having and looking at them as, as a special block on how to support given the, um, the, the, the Spanish language component. So, I mean, the Spanish materials component. And I would just add uh, that, um, you know, one of the options is a virtual school with accommodations. So we just call it that. So they will get the support they need. Thank you. And then regarding the waiver, we have not put together a waiver yet. Um, the guidelines for that, actually, it was funny. I got a, a alert from the Mercury News today. And actually, the, the guidelines came out last Friday. Um, I think one or two districts um, that I'm aware of have applied for theirs. We haven't yet. Um, what? You know, Mala has kind of gone through a, a process to identify, you know, what the priorities would be. I can tell you that one thing we were really disappointed about, um, and we asked the county the question earlier this week was, what about one-on-one um, assessments for special education students? We were thinking that's not really instruction. Could we at least do that? And they said currently under the guideline as they understood it, we can't even do that, which is just um, makes things impossible. Um, yeah, I know. <laughs> so that would probably be first on our list. And we'll put together a list. Um, the, re the requirements, as you know, um, require us to consult with um, our employee groups. And so we absolutely would be doing that, just as I, I really appreciate Wendy's comments. Um, Wendy and Jeremy and the their two teams have been just fantastic in continuing to communicate. And we would absolutely do that. Um, and then we would absolutely begin with teachers who are comfortable coming back. That's how we're going to start. Um, and, you know, I think we, I don't know, Molly, do you want to kind of allude to maybe like what the priorities would be in a waiver? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the conversation we had, uh, it's with a group of uh, administrators and uh, some coaches and a couple of teachers as well, is really looking at um, rather than identifying any group, whether it's SDC or TK or kindergarten or you know low SES or Hispanic or anything, uh, but just looking at students who are not able to access virtual school. When we start, um, just looking at the families for whom it's really you know a hardship, um, the students that are not able to be engaged you know online, um, and really identifying those that, despite follow-ups and despite concerted efforts at the school site, um, we feel would definitely be much better served in person. Um, I think that's the direction um, we are wanting to go in. And the county told us that it takes about two weeks once you submit the application to get a response. Although the districts that I heard from who've already submitted their, their waiver application, 
said they haven't even gotten um, a recognition that it was received. So I think they're pretty far behind, um, which makes me anxious too, because I'm kind of feeling like we kind of want to get the school year started, but we're going to lose a week or two, or at least two weeks um, after we submit it. So we'll be working on it. Board, any other questions or comments? I, I had a question. My dog just walked in, but <laughs> I still think it's okay. It's okay. Write it down. I'll, I'll get it next time, I'm sure. So okay, so you don't have a question? No, I, I lost track of it, sadly. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, board, any other questions or comments? Okay. Um, yeah. I just had a cup. Oh, go ahead, Nancy. Um, Mike talked about it in his remarks, but I wanted to um, cover it again that with regards to independent study, we're trying to work through um, accommodating as many families as we have capacity for. Is that correct? Because we just That's got- correct. And Actually, I'd, I'd say it a little stronger than that um, because I think the fear was that, like maybe we said it that way this evening to the parent group um, and they heard 400 signed up and there's 200 spots, so it's 50-50. Um, we really, as I said at the beginning, I think it's gonna be better than that. And as we get closer to meeting the need, we'll assess where enrollment has come in, not just in the independent study program, but in the virtual school um, program, and then where there'll be opportunities to pull a teacher or an FTE, um, where we might invest in an additional teacher um, to try to put the puzzle pieces together. Uh, okay. So we're really gonna try to accommodate everyone if we can, or, or pretty close, and that, that's gonna be hard. Um, it's a really complicated puzzle. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and that was my question. My question was sort of like that. It was like, what is happening? Are you finding like any sites as far as the independent study goes? Are you finding any sites like if you had uh, 50 kids from a big school, it might not be a big impact on the classes. I mean, the classes might be a little wonky, but are you finding like anywhere where the school site is like there's a lot of people who are requesting it or like a grade level and it's like there's only six kids left in virtual school because everyone else is doing independent study like are you finding any patterns like that where yeah so not not patterns we had to do some like mike was saying some extreme calculations about where the initial um demand was coming from mm -hmm. and then we applied that logic to try and identify and maximize the fte that we're pulling from those sites so i tried to explain tonight and again i got a little inside baseball about how staffing and numbers work but we have to basically say in order to pull it uh, the, the the fairwood teacher for example i gave a fairwood example we pull a, a, a primary teacher so in order to make that work we have to then prioritize those second i'm just making that up the second grade students from fairwood in order to make that pan out or else then fairwood's virtual school numbers would collapse a little bit and then they would have to do a you know combo you know so it, it was a, a careful balancing act where we had demand or unknown demand and how many were going to actually sign up we we have the number of staff members willing to embark on this journey of voluntary assignment and it's again those that have accepted the assignment are very very excited and so it's it's just a, a half step toward innovation i guess is the way they're looking at it and then you alluded to this then there's the variable of the remaining students in virtual school at the site so three moving parts and we tried to hit right in the middle and that's where we landed with our initial 10 uh, fte supporting roughly 200 independent study, but uh, the numbers you described, if it was that extreme where that there was higher demand across the board for independent study, it would have actually been able to pan out the way you're, de you're, de you're describing where we could have had maybe a teacher uh, at each site and, and they're serving their own students. But unfortunately it came in at like, you know, threes and sevens and maybe elevens, you know, it, it's, it's just really tough. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. But Jeremy, we can have teachers serve students from other schools for independent study, right? Yeah, that is the model that we're doing. But with that initial, initial, we have to be able to pull all, uh, you know, in some, in some circumstances, we have to pull the students in from their class who are interested in independent study to not blow up the virtual program, if that makes any sense. And then everything else, all the rest of the capacity, we, we've committed to creating um, grade level lottery and then be able to fill from that way. But, I mean, I, I guess I don't understand how you're going to get from four, from 200 spots to 400 spots. I know you're saying, well, we'll change it, but we're like, like, it's <laughs> no, I understand. And so that's why we, we sent out a form tonight after the meeting. Um, and we're going to keep reminding everybody until five, they have until five o'clock tomorrow to then commit. So that, that's the part. But I, I, I think we wanted to take this process because I'm interested in this because I'm, I don't like virtual school, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, is one thing. And then hearing the description of exactly what this independent study program is, is that other factor to make sure that you're, you know exactly what you're signing up for. Because um, in some cases, it wasn't what teachers were thinking. You know, some, some folks thought, oh, I get a one-on-one -on -one teacher, or I get the best of both worlds where I have access to all the classroom materials, but then I could do it on my own time. That's somewhat true, but they want that connection in the classroom where they meet at nine o'clock and then the work to accomplish themselves. So we really had to try to separate um, that they are two distinct programs and then parents are going to have to make that determination best fit for their child or children. So. Thanks. Thank you. Board, any other questions or comments? And I'll wrap up with mine. Um, I had a couple just really quick ones, and then I just had a few of my questions from packet review. Um, I just wanted to ask out in public and have them answered for um, those listening to hear. So my first one is the parent tech info night that um, happened last night. Was that recorded? And will that be put on our district reopening web website for people to view at later times? We've been sharing it directly in emails. Um, and now that we've switched to using YouTube channel, they live there, but that hasn't necessarily been promoted. We've just been sharing the links to recordings directly. Okay. It's, it seems like that would be a great, like the, I don't know exactly, but whatever the kind of resource page for parents that Mala was talking about, it seems like this tech info night that happened last night would be a great thing to link on that page. Um, and then um, another, just this is actually more a comment, uh, not so much question, but it, it would be great if, and maybe that's already happening, I don't know for sure, but if the, so not the district meetings, those are all getting recorded, but when the school sites have started doing their information nights, um, if they could also record them. So if someone can't make it live, that those parents, you know, families can still go back and look at that. So that would just be nice to make sure that the school site meetings are also getting recorded. Um, and then I'll just, um, uh, so then these are the questions from the um, packet that I just wanted to kind of share out. Uh, so the first one is, um, if families start the school year um, and then within a few weeks, they're feeling like the schooling option that they had picked is not a good fit for their child or for their family situation, who should they reach out to to talk with? And then, how are we, whatever that answer is, like, how are we going to get that information to parents so they're, they know who to reach out to? Hopefully that question makes sense. I shall say that one more time. <laughs> like, yeah. Okay. So a parent, right. They picked like the school year starts, right. And it's not working out. It's like my kids, right. Say we're doing virtual learning. And within the first few weeks, one of my kids, like it's for every reason, a disaster, right. Who, who do I, or who does a parent reach out to? to communicate that, that, hey, this isn't working out, is there another option? So one, who, who do they reach out to? And then the other piece is, how do we communicate that to parents? So parents know if they are struggling with something, who they should be reaching out to. So oh, can I just, uh, I don't know how this would be different. I don't think this would be different from a regular school year. So you'd always talk to your teacher first, you talk to your principal next. Uh, to try and, um, you know, make those uh, accommodations, find out what's not working, how can we support, because we don't want to go from one to another option without at least trying to problem solve. So I would always start with the teacher. Yeah. Just like you would in a regular school year, 
um, and then move up to the principal before it, uh, who would then consult with us and then we'd find a way um, to make it work and see what's been done, uh, what's been in place and what supports are needed. Yeah. So, so yeah, so then the follow-up question is how are we going to communicate that to families, right? I think not all families know that. And also I think more families mm -hmm. are going to have more questions and more struggles or more needing more support this year. So how are we going to communicate that? So families do know that structure that you just mentioned, Mala. I think it sounds great. One of the things um, a lot of the principals were talking about at our meetings today that uh, you know Mike mentioned is having back to school night much earlier. Uh, because they want to start getting to know their families and have conversations and share these kinds of important pieces of information. Um, so I think that would be the first venue for communication is through the teacher at back to school night. That's great. Thanks. Um, the next, um, I have two questions, two questions were kind of related to teacher preparation time. Um, so I'll share them both kind of at the same time. So the first one is what are we doing to create more prep time for teachers? Um, this first week that they're back next week um, kind of what have we been able to take off their plate and then the second question is not just for the first week but throughout the school year what are we doing to free up teacher time for them to be able to have more one-on-one -on -one interactions with students and th so that's you know talking about the virtual not the independent study so much so the the first one uh, talks about the first week of school so we have three days in the first week of school and um, Mike has graciously allowed uh, teachers to have uh, the first three days be minimum days. Um, so there is gonna be um, early dismissal on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, uh, because we know that they need time to just follow up on logistics, on um, you know, supports, on families that haven't shown up, on students that may not have device, something may kind of have got dropped in the mix. Um, so they have time and then to collaborate and talk to each other and just touch base. Um, so that they're ready to launch off um, in week two, which would be day four, really. So that would be um, one. And throughout the year, um, the schedule that I shared uh, briefly in my update uh, was about the Wednesday schedule, where we have a very um, specific time set aside in addition to the prep time that teachers have um, to be able to collaborate, learn from each other, engage in um, you know, some professional development, and really hone their skills because this is such a new endeavor. Um, I also mentioned a little bit about um, assessments. We're really having uh, more concerted um, efforts of assessment for learning and seeing uh, what might not be something necessary uh, that teachers do not have to uh, administer if it's not helping their instruction. Because really that connection between um, what the student needs and what the teacher is providing can only happen if they have more opportunities um, to keep finding out what the needs are. So there are just in time supports put in place um, and not um, you know, spending a lot of time on assessing if it's not gonna be helping their teaching because we are um, asking and teachers are definitely open to and wanting to do um, a combination of whole group, small group targeted instruction and independent follow-up. The last piece I'd say is uh, the asynchronous time that we've built, that has been built into the teacher workday, into the student schedule, um, is also an opportunity for teachers um, to be providing, um, you know, recordings uh, that will be available through a video bank. Uh, they're not recreating and reinventing and making up all of them individually or even at as a grade level. Um, and that's a time for them to also follow up individually with students and families as needed. We're doing our best. We've got a few, um, you know, conversations in place about how, and now we have staff meetings. Typically, they used to be after school, uh, but we are embedding them in uh, the school day on that Wednesday afternoon time. Absolutely, their um, time after school is their time, um, and it's not, uh, there's no mandated uh, requirement to participate in any meetings or things like that. Those are some of the ways that we've considered um, supporting teachers. Thank you. Um, the next question is, um, how will we meet students' mental health needs in virtual learning? Um, and how will we do it in the independent study model as well? Um, 
We have our cases um, that we have. We, we do this every year. So wh whatever students have um, already had cases for mental health uh, services and support or social work or counseling services, those roll over into the new year. So the social workers um, basically coordinate that in conjunction with our um, work with CHAC to kind of cultivate services and supports from campus to campus. So the plan is to continue those services for students that have already been identified. That would be no different for students who are in independent study as well. In addition to that, as we get going through the year, uh, one of the things that we've been talking about and trying to provide additional support on, and the social workers have been doing a really good job of this and got a little bit more skilled at the end of last school year, but being able to talk with the teachers and have those conversations so that teachers become more skilled at identifying, in, in particular in a virtual way, students who might have some challenges or um, might need some additional support. Um, and then having teachers to be sure to reach out to their designated social worker. And then the social worker would then follow up and see what supports might be needed and how they might be able to support the student and our family. And then if an actual assignment for ongoing services is needed, they would follow the same protocols that they typically follow. I think the difficulty will be is that unfortunately, teletherapy services does not work for every student. And that was one of the reasons why we were hopeful that the one-to-one -one type of assessments would be something that would be an approved service. And I'm still confused as to why it would not be, but Nonetheless, at this point, that is the requirements that we have because our hope with that was gonna be that for those students who did not respond, for example, to teletherapy services, we would be able to provide that one-to-one -one or small group at a park or somewhere else. But uh, we will have to deal with those unique circumstances case to case, but we do have a plan in place to deliver the services for the kids who can actually receive them. Great, thank you. Um, and then my last question is, um, how are we integrating equity and our equity statement into our school reopening plans? So many ways. <laughs> I was gonna say, it's part of everything we do, uh, but. Um, just being sensitive, uh, culturally, um, I think many of the things we typically do um, how we're offering materials, how classrooms are set up, um, how we integrate and work within our um, virtual setting. I think in every aspect we possibly can, actually. Thank you. Um, that is one. I appreciate that. I, we, we talked about this since we kind of started this equity conversation the last couple of years, but how we're all on board in it and it's a priority and something we want to keep coming back to, right? Um, thank you. Okay, uh, we are ready to, oh, um, is there any, sorry, let's get going. Um, if there's any public um, questions or comments related to COVID-19 updates, please um, use the raise hand feature now. Give it just a moment, but I'm not seeing any. Okay, I think we will now move to uh, our next agenda item, um, which is um, because of our adjustment, the review in action, and what was B is now A. So approval of resolution 21-04 in the matter of supporting Proposition 19, home protection for seniors, severely disabled families, and victims of wildfire or natural disasters act. Uh, Dr. Gallagher. And I forgot to staff, thank you all of you for all your work. Thank you for those updates. And thank you from all of us, all the board, we appreciate what you do. Okay, on to the next item, Dr. Gallagher. Okay, thank you. So um, this is regarding um, endorsement, the board's potential endorsement of a proposition that will be on the ballot in November. Um, I'm bringing this to you as a result of Schools for Sound Finance 
um, their executive board recommending that districts endorse it, uh, community funded districts such as ours. Um, this is not to be confused with Proposition 15, which is um, essentially the split role tax um, revision of Proposition 13. There's two that are going on the ballot at the same time. This one's different. Um, I'm bringing this to you. I know we're, we're actually one of the first districts, I think, to take a look at it because this Schools for Sound Finance presented the information right before our agenda was due. So I thought, well, let's jump on it. And so it's if, if you feel comfortable making a motion and voting one way or another tonight, that's fantastic. Um, if you decide that you need more information, that's okay too, we could always bring it back. But I realize that we're bringing it um, too early and that unfortunately Larry Stone had to leave the meeting. So I, I know some of you were like waiting for his comments, but um, with that, um, for your consideration is the matter supporting Proposition 19. Thank you, Mike. Reed, go ahead. Sure, I'll make a motion um, that we approve resolution number 2104 in matter of supporting Prop 19, Home Protections for Seniors, Severely Disabled Families and Victims of Wildfire or Natural Disasters Act. A second. Thank you. Um, so let's let's maybe do public comment first. We'll open up if there's any public who has any questions or comments on this agenda item. So if there's any public who would like to speak, please use the raise hand feature now. All right, I'm not seeing any. Board, is there any um, questions or comments? Um, I'll go ahead and just talk to it for a bit. Um, yeah, so I wanted to do a little more research on this and understand what the pros and cons are. Um, California did deny a similar um, proposition a couple years back, um, which would have enabled people to take their tax rate with them to other counties in California. Um, but this definitely would behoove our district and lots of other districts um, in terms of anybody that sells their house here would be able to take their 55 or over would be able to tax, take their tax rate with them anywhere in California. Um, and typically um, that would mean that would be more sales, more people moving and opening up more homes here that would then be at the regular property tax rate. And it also takes away um, where if you give, if you pass on and you give your house to your kids, they used to be able to rent it out and keep your low property tax. And now they wouldn't be able to unless they lived in the home. And I definitely think that if parents pass on a, a house to their children and their children live there, the tax rate should stay the same because those children might not be able to afford it. Um, but the fact that they're renting it out, it makes sense. So that would definitely give um, a lot more money to property tax. And I think that's not questionable at all, that part of it. I think the only part of it that's questionable is that there's some counties that would prefer that people don't bring their tax rate with them if they buy houses in their county. So if that happens, then they don't get as much um, property tax. But um, I'm definitely willing to support this based on um, SF2 and based on you know um, the advantage to our community and our um, older people that might wanna move um, within California into a county like Santa Cruz doesn't accept it right now, but then they would. Anyway, so that's kind of where I am. I mean, I see both sides to a certain extent. I don't understand fully the implications. Maybe everybody, nobody really does, but I do know that the implications for us would likely be quite positive. Thanks, Reed. Board, is there other questions or comments? I talk so fast. How am I going to slow down? So Reed, can you just state like why it's positive for us? Why is it? Yeah. Oh, because people don't usually retire to, to Sunnyvale. So typically what would happen in our community is people would leave. And so, um, but let's say they wanna go to Santa Cruz or they wanna go to a county where now they can't bring their tax rate with them, it becomes not affordable for them to move to those places, so they stay. A lot of times people will just stay because they say, I can't afford to move to the house I want because I paid $500,000 for my house or $300,000 or $100,000 for my house however many years ago, but if you move to another house that costs double or triple, the tax rate is so much higher. Um, so in our community, because it's not really a place where people come to retire, it's a place where people leave when they get older 
it would open up more homes at, uh, yeah. Okay. So, uh, so do we know what Larry might have said? Did he send a letter or anything? He didn't, he didn't send a letter. But he didn't do tell us his opinion, did he? Did he say he was neutral on it? What did he say, Mike? Yeah, I don't think it's anything. Yeah, I didn't actually talk to him. I know he's very vehemently opposed to Proposition 15. Right. Um, and in those discussions, he would have had an opportunity to say something about Proposition 19, but he, he hasn't, to my knowledge. So what I expect he would have talked about tonight would have been um, the implications for this for our school district, which I mean, I think Reed, you summarize pretty nicely. Every time a house sells, it gets reassessed. And so more houses that turn over not only creates more housing for our community and for our families, um, it also um, brings in a higher tax base. Yeah, so I'd say the two, what, what would have been helpful for me coming from Larry is the like the feasibility of it, right? There was the, maybe it's Prop 15, but whatever that initiative was a year or two ago when we at first were thinking oh this is great let's start having people you know sign stuff and then we also learn like that it's not even though it might sound good that it's not actually feasible to implement so I'm a little bit curious on the implement imp, is that a word implementability implementation but I don't think that this is an issue about implementation I think it's more I mean I think it's easy to implement it's not the issue with the other with prop 15 was there was laws around how many employees you have so he would have to go and query every single company and then they could misrepresent like he was talking about all the specifics that made prop that makes prop 15 impossible yeah. for him to enforce i don't think that enforceability is an issue here i think it's more about what's fair you know and, yeah, and but i just i just don't know for sure right? i don't understand that stuff and the other piece um that i this is what what's hard for me where i just don't feel like i have enough information right now yet is I agree that idea as people, if more people are then encouraged to sell their homes and it gets reassessed, we get more money and that is great for our district. Um, I don't understand all the economic stuff, but I just know in this area, renting a house is actually cheaper than buying a house and a mortgage. So yes, it'd bring in more property tax, but another piece of me is saying, but then less houses would be rented because of lots, I know lots of people who like their children have it and it's a rental property i'm just confusing and so mm. like i had a friend who just sold her house and she's like i feel kind of bad that we sold our second house because we were providing a service for people to be able to rent at a lower price than buying so that's the tricky part is buying is a very high bracket of people whereas rental market it's just all very tricky that's a good point that's true because if you get that low um, property tax on a rental, then you're more likely to keep to make it a rental. Yeah, yeah on my uh, street, there's there's two, three homes now, and two that were turned over to the kids. You know, uh, either when the parent passed away or or moved out, and um, they're all being rented. One of them to six single women. <laughs> six cars that's a lot of cars on the cul de sac girl yeah. yeah yeah but i mean there's they're all it's all they're all rental properties well so do we need to think about this a little more or like so i think i'd like to think about this um a little more and understand what the <sighs> it makes me sad <laughs> about the fact that um, seniors can't afford to retire in Sunnyvale. Um, that were um, so I need to understand a little bit more about those about those implications and about family legacy and those those kinds of things and what the tax implications are if if that hamstrings families options. Um, it does. Does that have more benefits than seniors moving away? You know, we're making it easier for seniors to move away, and what does that say about our community too? So it's when it's pushed. Um, I'm wondering, Mike, would it be possible maybe if 
if any questions the board has, we could email you uh, just a, not, not a long list, but a small handful of questions that we can maybe then shoot to Larry, the ones that would be related to his piece of this, you know? That's a good idea. Um, and kind of get some of that information. And as Nancy was talking, I had another idea to suggest, but it went out of my head. <laughs> um, if I think of it later, I will share it. Yeah, that'd be great. So if you, if you send me your questions, um, I'll forward them to Larry or his, his admin for him to respond to. Uh, and the other, the other idea came to me, the other thought was, um, you know, because this came about from schools for sound finance who were a part of, you know, and they have the best interests of our type of districts, you know, and they're in favor of this. So I don't know if there's a way, I don't know if we'd have specific questions for them or if we could get more information from them. So maybe we could do the same thing. If we have questions specific for them, we shoot that to you, Mike. And if we have questions for Larry, and then we can maybe gather some more information. Perfect. Does that sound good to the rest of the board if we maybe, so I guess is tabling it, is that the right, is that how we do that? Or are we pulling it off? I don't know the exact process. Yeah, we can table it for a future date after we get our questions answered. So I think Reed would um, withdraw her motion. Okay, I will um, make a motion to withdraw my motion. <laughs> um, do we need to make a motion to table it? Sure, I will make a motion to withdraw my motion for now and to table it for a future meeting. A second. All right. Um, any more discussion before we vote on so that it's to table this item? All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Here votes aye. And with that, the motion is passed. So we are tabling that item. Um, sorry, I'm toggling between uh, different screens here. So the next item. Uh, is the approval of resolution 21-01 in the matter of Sunnyvale School District Governing Board Black Lives Matter. Dr. Gallagher. Thank you. I'm very proud of our district for putting this together and uh, presenting it to you uh, this evening. Um, a subcommittee of the board, Reed and Michelle, um, worked together on this and really did good work grabbing different resolutions that different districts have Put together. Um, we brought this to cabinet for um, the perspective of cabinet um, and we added, I think we took the best um, of the various districts that we saw and we added our own elements too to make it a very Sunnyvale resolution. So um, I'm proud to present this to you for your consideration. Sorry about the delay. Sometimes it doesn't click the unmute. Um, let's. Uh, so I move approval of resolution 21 04. Oh, no, excuse me. Wrong one. It flipped on me. Um, uh, 21 02, the resolution of the Sunnyvale School District Governing Board, uh, Black Lives Matter. I'll second. Oh, one. Twenty-one oh one, right? Yeah, yes. Um, public, if there's any um, questions or comments on this item, please use the raise hand feature. All right, I'm not seeing any, so we'll move on to um, board questions or comments on this item. Well, I was looking at the, um, I guess my only comment was, was that um, some of the other resolutions that this one was kind of pulled from and modified and, and made into our own language are, are there's, some more specific action items in them. So, um, I'm just wondering if, if there was any interest in modifying it with some more like specific action items. What are the action items that you, maybe you want to, do you want so, to share? Let me just to add. I'm trying to open the, 
Bridget, I don't have the Palo Alto one in front of me, but I did read it. I felt like some of it was so almost too specific and too like, we will not be blah, 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 blah. It just got so intensely negative that part of that kind of turned me off. Sure. Um, but um, so I definitely considered, I looked at their resolution. They really like, they made it so specific. And so like most of the other districts were like ours where they were kind of a little higher level, more we're supportive. You know, I feel like we do a lot with our equity statement. There's a lot that we actually do. And I think actions speak louder than words. Right. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I do see that we say we declare that black, black lives matter and condemn discrimination and that we are committed to providing safe spaces and we're committed to fostering practices and providing professional development to address social injustice. But I feel like, you know, um, the one that I, the one that I, other, the Palo Alto one, for example, um, it's, uh, it's just, I think that the one that really struck me was um, they had a one number four that we did not include that I thought was positive um, and it was Palo Alto Union School Unified School District will confront the biases in our own school district and actively engage in the challenging work of dismantling the problematic practices that are limiting the opportunities for our black and brown students. And I, I feel like ours is very focused on the positive, but I feel like we, I feel like in this resolution, we should be committed to looking at the stuff that, that we know, the stuff we can't quite see yet, or the systemic stuff within our own district. And I guess I was just hoping that when I first forwarded the Palo Alto resolution to Ben, because I think um, Melissa Batten Caswell forwarded it to us. Um, so I forwarded it to Ben, and I was like, hey, this would be great. It's similar to the um, anti Asian American, anti Asian discrimination resolution, but it's very specific to support Black Lives Matter. You know, time has gone by this summer, and there's been a lot of political activity around Black Lives Matter, but I feel like, I guess I'm, I was wondering in ours if there could be something that is committing to look at ourselves. I think we could like, add that. I mean, I think we could add that line, you know, with a whereas, if we all agree that we're comfortable with it and we could figure out where to put it. Well, because when you read it to me, I'm like, I'm on board with that. I mean, I don't know how everyone else feels. Well, I feel like we've made our commitment in our equity statement and so to so at some point in time um uh so we are looking at it and we're looking at it in a in a in a broader sense and i think um well, I'm okay with saying that is like saying like through our work with equity and the development of an equity plan or our work with, you know, whatever. I'm okay with saying that we're doing it in our own way. But I feel like just the sentiment that we are going to examine ourselves and hold ourselves accountable. I feel like that that's the feel that's the part that I feel is missing from our version and and it's not I'm not saying we have to so um, have angry whatever language if if we're not comfortable i mean i'm personally angry about things right now but i'm but i, I just i feel so deeply that that if we are gonna if we are looking at ourselves and we're committed to looking at ourselves then we, this is a good place to state that you know and maybe it doesn't matter maybe it's just a resolution that's going to get passed and like no one's going to look at it again and we're going to feel really good about passing it. But I, I feel like this is a place where to start integrating that commitment everywhere, you know? So I have a thought. So I kind of already feel like it was there, but it could maybe just be because we've all already committed to that work. And I think there is a balance, like the resolution is resolutions in and of themselves in all areas of government is a field of document. There is no, 
action from resolutions. Resolutions by intent are feel goods, right? So really action items need to be in other places, but I get what you're saying about having something there. So I was just kind of reading through it and reading. So it's the last, if you guys have it open right now. Um, so it's the, be it for the resolve. So I guess kind of the fourth paragraph from the end. And it says, be it for the resolve that the Sunnyvale School District Governing Board is committed to providing safe spaces for discussion on race and injustice. And then the next one, be it further resolved that the Sunnyvale School District is committed to fostering practices and providing professional development to address social injustices, bias, and, in, and inequ inequity in all aspects of the district's work. So I kind of feel like it's there, but I'm also happy to, in one of those two paragraphs, add one sentence, because I think all of us as board members have already committed right to doing that work. So if... I'm, I would be fine putting a sentence in one of those two paragraphs. Well, so, I mean, maybe yeah. instead of like, I mean, I guess it, it's, there's a difference between fostering practices and providing professional development. And then I guess for me, the part of the other thing that seemed more powerful. So I don't think that Palo Alto has an equity, they're not involved in, you know, equity um, plan or their, so this was their t opportunity to say what they're com what they're committing to, and I think we've made a commitment in a different way. In a in a po in a policy way, if if you don't if you feel that our equity statement does not have the teeth to it that shows that we're committed to do this work, then we need to go back. We we don't need to put it here we need to go back to the equity statement that we made. Well, I just, I feel like, you know, I feel like the willingness to confront biases and the willingness to dismantle problematic practices in our own thing that I feel like the acknowledging that there is a problem is, is a, is a first step. And I feel like, that's different than the equity. The equity statement is what we believe and what we're trying to do, right? And so, and so, I, if it doesn't have the, I, I, I it, this is a bigger question, and so I want to make sure that if you don't feel that we've committed it, the, if if you don't feel that we've made the commitment in our overarching policy, then um, that's something we need to really talk about um, instead of inserting it in every little in, in every little thing. Oh, so Bridget, Bridget, maybe what we need to do is look at some of our policies and ensure that we in our policies say we are willing to look at ourselves and ensure, you know, face our inequities, face the things that we're doing that are right. I mean, I think it's fine to put it in the resolution, but it does mean more if it's in a policy. Because that's right. what we I, I do want to look at the policies. I, I guess I'm saying like this is a Black Lives Matter resolution, and the thing this the la pretty much the last thing the Palo Alto thing was like we're going to look at anything that we have in our policies that are limiting things for our Black and Brown students because Black Lives Matter. And I feel like you know any I get it that I'm I mean I I get it that I'm not. Um, a person who is black or brown on, on this, but I, I feel so deeply that this is, that this is the point of the resolution and that we're talking in generalities and positivity and like, I'm trying to just state that, that we're acknowledging that we're willing to look at our problem like at any problems that we're having. And so that's just all I'm saying. And I think I'm probably really talking about this really wrong. I just, I don't, I don't know how to get that out is that I just, I don't know. Well, I think what other people are saying is, and I, and I agree with both of you. I mean, so actually maybe, maybe it would be healthy to table this one as well. And we can continue with some suggested wording in the, uh, in line, but I hear what Nancy's saying and, and I hear what Bridge is saying and I, and I, I like what I'm hearing, but maybe we reference the equity statement within the resolution in those some of the same commitments we made in the equity statement. 
place it into the resolution. It, it is in the resolution, Jeff. I, I guess that's what I'm trying to have a hard time understanding then is what, what actions are we looking at? So here's what I, here's what I think. I, if, I'm hearing that we want more wording, but I'm, I'm trying to figure out, I, I, I understand the, the, the desire to do something tangible, but I'm, what is it? So I guess what I'm saying is, is that in the thing, in, in the R statement that is wonderful and very reflective of Sunnyvale, it's very positive. It's very, you know, earnest and it's very, you know, it, it's very genuine and I really like that. And it does reflect our equity, equity statement. But what it doesn't, what I don't see, what I was hoping for, like just what surprised me about it was that there wasn't a statement of the problem, right? Which is the resolution, maybe, maybe we don't think we have a problem is what I'm sort of hearing. I or, don't get the impression that was a lot of the conversation in our equity statement is, I, you know, and, and, you know, I guess I'm a little, I'm a, I'm a little lost and, and, and I, I, all right, can I, can I interject right here? So because yeah, if this was a policy, I would say, let's continue this long discussion. This is a resolution. Yeah. Right. That like, it's just, it is, it's fluffy words. They're, they are very important fluffy words, but it's not the meat of what we do, right? This is super yeah. important conversations that we need to continue and have real conversations about the real work, but this is okay. a resolution. So we're going to have a, we're going to talk about what our meet next meeting is going to be for around equity. So that's fine. So I fully support the resolution in support of black lives matter. Yeah. And I, I don't have a problem with that. I, 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 was just, I don't think, I don't think we're saying we don't have a problem. I we think would, we all are on the same page. It's just wording. It's just wording things in it. So I would say let's add. So on that first paragraph that I read, so be it for the resolve that the Sunnyvale school district governing board is committed to providing safe spaces for discussions on race and racial, racial injustice. Then help me with wording because I'm not good with wording. We put a comma and then we say something about and commit and the board is committed to doing this work themselves. Someone can make that sound wording better. Because that gets kind of what you're talking about, Bridget, right? That idea that we as a board are committing to do this work, not just generally for the staff. You can look at ourselves, like take responsibility for looking at me. and facing it. You know. but do you, wanna, if you guys want to hold off? We can ask Bridget to add a, a sentence in there and we'll bring it back next time. I mean, well, we can next time is a month away. I really would love to. Yeah, pass let's just support it. it. Okay. Bridget, can you put the words in right now? Um, we can I'm just fine. do I'm fine with whatever. I just, it's okay. It's fine. I'm sorry. No, I just, no, I was I really. Apologize. Well, I guess my question is what. <laughs> I mean, I, I, like I said, I, I am, maybe it's the fact that I, I <laughs> I'm at a lot. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm I, like I said, I, I'm, I'm at the cusp of hearing what you're saying. And I, I maybe you are. Well, like, let me just read it. Actually, like, let's too. say it was our so, school district saying this. I'm, yeah. I'm saying I like what Nancy is saying as well, then, as I'm getting a little bit better understanding of what the conversation is. And, Maybe the fact that we're having a hard time articulating action, maybe that really does show, demonstrate that we need to go back and, and talk about what actions we need to take. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, you know, like, like they were saying, like, like we were talking about in the equity statement, uh, the, while we're developing it, this is hard work and it, it makes us uncomfortable. And, and maybe some of the discomfort is we just we're not even aware of what, what biases might be out there, right? Right, and I I mean I felt like when I read the Palo Alto one, um, you know, I liked the rest of ours much better for us. But when I got to that last one, like if I read that and I said, if it's we said Sunnyvale School District will confront the biases in our own school district and actively engage in the challenging work of dismantling the problem problematic practices that are limiting the opportunities for our black and brown students. Like that is a very powerful we can add that whole sentence. It's okay. You want to add that? Well, I personally do, but. Okay, you know, well then that's the discussion. That, and like that would be something, maybe I want to add that to our whole equity statement. Nancy's shaking her head. But I'm saying like that is like a very, that's a resolution and the, the, 
I'm not saying that like, well, we can't pass the resolution if we don't modify our equity statement. I don't want to modify our equity statement tonight, but I think it's an ongoing conversation. And I think for this document, when I read the original document, I was like, Ben, we should do this. That's because that's what I think we're all committed to doing is we so I think to bring this particular discussion to a close, we should consider whether or not we want to add that additional statement. Are you guys okay with adding that sentence that Bridget just read to our resolution? Are yeah, so I think I think we should add it as the we have those the be it further resolves, the two that I read. Yeah. We can just add it as the final be it be it resolved right before the finally be it resolved. Okay. So Bridget, can you uh, in the chat send that out and give it to Jesus and we can approve the resolution with that as the final and then just we, he can just send it out and we can just make sure that it's in the right place and it's good. Yeah. We can approve it. Should I put it in the chat or should I put it? I already have it. You oh, have it. Way to go, Jesus. Awesome. Jesus is on it. Okay, okay. let's, let's so, vote. Let, I, who made the resolution? Who made the, who made the, made the motion needs to amend it. <laughs> Nancy, motion, uh, and Jeff, second. Okay. <laughs> Um, so, um, I amend, for purpose of discussion, I amend the motion to include the following language, and you have the language, Jesus. Yes. Okay. Could you read that? Could you read that language out? Sure. Thank you. Be resolved that the Sunnyvale School District will confront the biases in our own school district and actively engage in challenging work to dismantle the problematic practices that are limiting the opportunities for our black and brown students. Okay. Does someone need to second the amended motion? I'll second. Okay. Or Jeff seconds, whatever. Yeah. Whoever whoever seconded it earlier. Oh, that, was Jeff. that was that was me. I'll second. Okay. Awesome. Any other discussion before we vote? I, you know, I like I said, don't. I like how you're speaking your voice, and uh, you know, I, I just, uh, encourage. I think I think the equity statement is the way we need to go, because mm -hmm. I think that's going to be more present with us. And uh, that's more actionable. It's, re it's a good reminder. It follows us wherever we go, and it's good to revisit. I think sometimes the resolutions, and I might be just as guilty as, I see it's kind of a, a political statement or a commitment, you know, and, and uh, but it's a good reminder to take it to heart as well. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. Good job, Bridget. You're so passionate. I want to support that passion. So I believe this is a roll call vote. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Are you ready for the roll call? Yes, thank you. Jeff Arnett? Aye. Michelle Maginot? Aye. Reed Myers? Aye. Nancy Newkirk? Aye. Bridget Watson. Aye. <laughs> thank you. So with that, the motion passes. Um, thank you, everyone. And I'm grateful that we are all committed to this work, right? And let's continue it in the policies and practices where it really will make a difference. OK, on to 9C. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Approval of memorandum of understanding between El Camino Healthcare District and Sunnyvale School District. Sure, I'll go ahead and make the motion on that. I, hold on, I, hold on. Let them oh. talk first. <laughs> All right, I believe this goes to Jeremy. Yes, uh, before you is the aforementioned and discussed MOU with the El Camino um, Hospital District regarding um, a community partnership to offer testing to our employee, a testing program to our employees for COVID-19. Very excited about this, obviously. Um, I'd like to move that we approve the memorandum of understanding between our district and the El Camino Healthcare District on COVID-19 services. 
I'll second. And then Michelle, if, if I may, um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Cohen is he's the governmental affairs representative from El Camino Hospital. He's been listening all along. He just said he would not like to prolong tonight's meeting, but is also just wanted me to share that he is proud of the partnership. El Camino Health uh, Healthcare District has approved $2.4 million in funding to test as many people within their healthcare district. And fortunately, Sunnyvale falls within that and which has brought us together for that partnership. Um, and again, this is a public health initiative to slow the spread of COVID-19. Um, they are pleased to partner with us as the, as the sense that we have are offering essential workers in, in the field of education. Um, they uh, aspire to offer no cost testing for, the, um, for this program. So if, if the employee takes benefits from us, that is completely covered with no copay with our current health plan. And again, if the employee does not happen to take our district benefits, the El Camino Hospital District carries that cost. So no cost out of pocket for our employees. So that is fantastic. Um, and we have already been taking steps to implement this program prior to the even the MOU. El Camino Health District has uh, uh, conducted site visits to uh, two or three of our sites when this program um, will be scheduled. So upon the approval of this MOU, they will move forward swiftly to implement the testing program of which the first date will be in uh, early September and we will keep you posted as well as all employees. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, is there any um, public um, questions or comments on this item? Not seeing any. We had a, we had a second on the motion, right? Okay. Yeah, Bridget. Yeah, board, is there any other um, questions or comments on this item? That's awesome. Yeah. Very yeah. And if Jonathan's still listening, you can pass along to him. Thank you. Um, we appreciate, we appreciate their partnership and their support. Um, that's how we're going to get through these times. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Chair Chair votes aye, and with that, I think everyone said aye. I didn't quite hear everyone. Aye. With that, the motion uh, passes. We are now on to uh, 10, the consent agenda items. Is there a motion? We move to approve the consent agenda items. second i'm gonna start reading this my my screen is like i i can't see the you know like i have to like go and find the motions i'm toggling and so i apologize for being late on that it is a little tricky um is there any questions or comments from the public on this item or is there any questions or comments on this item or items. All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Chair votes aye, and with that, the motion passes. We are now on to 11 public comments on closed session items. So we'll give it just a moment if there are any, um, if any public wishes to speak on the closed session items, please use the raise hand feature. All right, not seeing anyone. We will convene to close session. Um, do we want to go straight there or do we want a five minute break? Let's go straight. Do we have, um, I don't, we have the closed session Zoom. Do I? I don't remember saving it anyway. Can someone send me the closed session Zoom? Because An email was sent to us just a little bit before the meeting, so you oh. might not have seen it. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, like I saw it right before. So if you go into your email, there should okay. be an email there. That's why I don't recall seeing it. Okay, thanks. Yeah, if you don't see it, then text somebody. Oh, I got it. Yeah. Are we, Thank so you. everyone's good if we just go straight there? Yeah, okay. okay. Thanks. Okay. And we'll come back to report out when we are done.
Hello. In closed session, we discussed conference with labor negotiator um, and conference with legal counsel about existing litigation. No action was taken. And we are now on to 14 um, for future meetings. Um, so our next meeting is August 27th at 7 p.m. It's a board study session. Um, Mike, do you want to kind of talk and then I can jump in a little bit? Really quick on the agenda, it's a, I meant to comment on this, I didn't, it said board meeting and board study session. So it's not a regular board meeting, it's just a study session. Yeah, I don't know why it has both on there. Okay. Hey, Suze, could you um, define what a regular board meeting is? Because I just learned this. So because you guys created a calendar of meetings, those are normally your regular board meetings. Even though you guys have a development part of the meeting, it's still considered a regular board meeting that has embedded a study session in it. Okay. We just that have to think when we think about it. And that sounds good. I know that was a different way for me too, <laughs> but thank yeah. you. So it doesn't change what we're doing. It's just part of the technical. I just hope it doesn't mess up people too, where they think that it's a regular, I mean, it is a regular board meeting, obviously, but, it, but it's regular meeting slash board study session. It's a regularly scheduled meeting. Yeah. yeah. It's and fine. Got it. Okay, so for the agenda, um, I would recommend that we make one of the items the equity action plan to devote some time to that. Um, I think it would probably benefit me if there was a closed session um, regarding my 90 day plan. So that could go under superintendent's evaluation, I suppose. Um, and we'd love to hear how school's going because it will have been on for a week. Right. So I was, my thought, and then, you know, of course, it's totally up to you, is equity action plan and maybe COVID-19 update or something like that. Um, that could be a lot. I don't know if you want to squeeze like one more thing in there, um, board development or anything like that. Well, we, we always have the placeholder for, uh, for these types of meetings for um, roles, responsibilities, in case there's any functional thing that we need to talk about um, okay. about the human dynamic <laughs> so so make that an agenda item is that yeah well, we'll know by then if we're having an election right I think so we know. yeah definitely we'll know by tomorrow I don't think we are um, we'll know by Friday or tomorrow yeah, Friday, Friday. Well, it's by Friday but it might be by tomorrow night I think by tomorrow, I think they like do the finishing stuff tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Okay, so does that, um, does that sound good to everyone? So the focus will be on equity and kind of updates and information about the 90 day plan. Those will kind of be the two main things, but then we also will get um, a brief kind of update of how the opening of school has. Come. That could be under COVID-19, yeah. yeah. Does that, that sound great. good to everyone? Any? And, and the roles, responsibilities, and other in case there's. Just in case. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I just do don't mean? think we would have time probably to discuss anything else. Sounds good. What do, you mean? Mean? what do you mean by roles, responsibilities? Do I need to prepare anything? <laughs> okay. No, it just, it, it just, I think it's just always on the board. In the past, it has just been on the board study sessions. It's been there and we usually will use it to like, that's when we talk about the governance handbook or when we talk about other stuff. Okay. So I'm fine putting on there. I just think we, d we don't want to plan anything in that area that would take a lot of time. Right. Unless we want to take something else off of the agenda. Because honestly, the COVID-19 update, by then we'll be in the middle of school. Everything will be fine. Yeah, be quick. No, they'll, yeah, sure. But there'll be a lot of discussion, I'm sure. It's, yeah. this, it's just going to be that kind of year. Awesome. Okay. Maybe just maybe the waiver, maybe who knows. Yeah. Okay, so if that sounds good with everyone, then that gives you direction for planning it yeah, when we can work together. Okay. Any other questions or comments about that meeting? Okay, I adjourn this meeting at 1034. Okay, thank you guys. Thanks, Happy everybody. anniversary tomorrow.